It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life. On this Monday, February 14th, 2022. Hello again, everyone. I hope you're doing well. And a very happy Valentine's Day to all the lovers out there. Hope you're uh, cuddling up by the fire, a little drink, a little nosh, and watching or listening to your favorite mixed martial arts twice a week program. The MMA Hour is here on a frigid, woo, a frigid, Post Super Bowl Monday in New York City. Congratulations to the LA Rams. So happy that's over with. And I can't wait for the Monday after the Super Bowl next year when I am celebrating my Buffalo Bills finally winning the Lombardi Trophy, of course. More importantly, it's a post pay per view Monday here on the program. We have a lot to discuss. Israel Adesonia is still the reigning defending UFC middleweight champion. He defeats Robert Whitaker via decision. I thought it was an entertaining fight. It went the distance, as a lot of us suspected. And I think that uh, now it's going to get interesting. It's going to get interesting with Izzy to see how many times he can fight this year and also see who is next. Is his next opponent Jared Cannonier? He was victorious. Great win for Jared Cannonier. Of course, Tai Tuivasa with a massive win on Saturday's where We're going to get to all of that and more today on the program. Later on, we'll be joined by Rick's Picks. We'll check in with GC to get a recap of his picks. Johnny Walker is the new main event this Saturday, so we'll check in with him. He's fighting Jamal Hill after the RDA Rafael Fazia fight got pushed. I could talk to you about that as well. My old friend Booker T, who was a media member on Saturday, he'll join us to talk about his experience in Houston. We'll talk to Roxanne Modafferi. I'm looking forward to that. Of course, she retired on Saturday, and the aforementioned Jared Cannonier is also going to join us. So a lot to discuss on this post-pay-per-view Monday, 271 in the books. Before we get to our first guest of the day, and I can't wait to talk to him, as always, we are brought to you by DraftKings. DraftKings Sportsbook is the official sports betting partner of the UFC. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today. Use code the MMA Hour for a special offer when you sign up. Again, that's code the MMA Hour only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Support them because they support us. So on Wednesday, we had Izzy's head coach, Eugene Behrman, on the program. As I said before and after, love getting his insight, love talking to him, because unlike some others in his position in the sport, he tells it like it is. There's no BS. It's unfiltered. It's legit. It's honest. It's very authentic. And so you can you can sit here and listen to me talk about the fight on Saturday, or you can sit here and listen to Eugene talk about the fight on Saturday. I'd rather sit here and listen to Eugene talk about the fight on Saturday. So without further ado, let's go to the Zoom machine and say hello to the head coach over at CKB, the one and only Eugene Behrman joining us. Eugene, how are you, sir? Good day, Ariel. Um, yeah, what do you, what do you think of the fight? Oh, we're, wow. No no pleasantries, no <laughs> hellos. Uh, okay, we're getting right into it. I like it. Uh, I like the fight very much. Um, it was, as I said, I, I suspected it was going to go the distance. I thought it would be a lot more... Um, uh, hotly contested, if you want to say, than the first one. Uh, obviously, Rob, you know, has has come some sort of way, long way, short way, whatever you want to say. Uh, I scored it to not beat around the bush, 49-46. I thought uh, Izzy won four rounds to, to one. I thought the only round that he definitively lost was the fifth. Perhaps you can make a case for another round, but I'm seeing a lot of smart people make a case for Rob, and I just don't get it. So that's my thoughts out of the way. How did you feel about the fight? Uh, yeah, I mean, I felt um, I felt comfortable the whole the whole way through the fight, and uh, I'm obviously the worst person to, to to like kind of make an assessment of it in terms of the public because I obviously um, I'm gonna have a I might have a bias, but I think um, four one's a good assessment at a stretch. I don't see it, but maybe three two, but. Um, to give Robert the fight, I think is yeah you you're 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 dealing with an area of uh, where you're going into a space where you're teetering with just not being intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair <laughs> enough. You said it, uh, not me. Um, were you happy with Izzy's performance? I, I was happy. I was happy with his performance. Um, I'm not going to say that that was like one of his more outstanding performances, but um, I'm going to say that he uh, he got the job done. 
you know, like he, he got the job done convincingly. Okay. And, um, and so I'm, I'm happy with that. Was there anything that Rob did that uh, surprised you at all based off of what he did in the first fight? Mm. No, not really. Uh, we, why I, uh, I mean, I predicted um, me and Israel um, and the coaching team predicted that he would wait a lot more. We, we basically thought it would be a more even mix of him having spirits of aggression and him waiting. And, and, and it was exactly that. Um, instead of last time, he was mainly all, it was all a lot of aggression and pushing forward. We thought it would be a, a bit of a mixture of the two. What actually surprised us more is as, uh, as, a, as we felt the fight was um, slipping away from Robert, we, fight, we thought he would risk the biscuit a bit more. Mm. Um, but he was very... He seemed very content to not come after it um, as aggressively as we thought he might um, at the start of each round. So um, maybe maybe that's got to do with um, his corner and where he where his corner advised him in terms of where the fight. But that was perhaps the only thing that um, did it that surprised us is that we we expected uh, a lot more aggression especially as he fell behind and we had some stuff um we had a few couple of traps set up for him um but he just wasn't he wasn't aggressive he he waited a lot more for israel than i thought he would so you said uh last week you were uh predicting a whitewash right you thought it would go the distance you wanted it to go the distance is this is this a whitewash in your opinion like was this the type of fight that you thought when you you know when you were predicting Um, last week no, nah, I'm not going to say it was a whitewash because I think Israel could have done uh, better. I thought Israel could have done better. Um, I thought defensively he was good. He just needed a little bit more offense. But um, that's easier said than done. When you've got a guy waiting who's clearly trying to draw you in, who's truly, who's truly trying to set a trap, it's a lot easier said than done to just be more aggressive. It's not as simple as just being more aggressive and giving the other fighter what he wants. And um, so I, I, well, I was, con- let's say it was convincing, but not the whitewash we wanted. But we're, 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 we're walking away from this, like, happy with the result and confident that that was the right result. Curious, what could he have done better, in your opinion? Um, well, he, he could have, there's some couple of things that, uh, you know, that I asked him to do to help. You could see that he was struggling with Robert waiting so much, mm. and he was he was um, all the waiting was making Israel a little anxious to be aggressive. So there's a couple of things I asked him to throw some um, what what do they call like false leads, like um, not they're not feints, but they're pretending to go in so that you can see what Robert's intentions are a little bit more. Some balk right hands where you throw the right hand, but you don't really commit to it something to just draw out a little bit more what Robert was going to get so so Israel could see it and then when he actually wanted to attack he could he could uh, mm-hmm. be a lot more confident um but he, you know for sometimes it's you're not always able to translate what's going on with the corner and stuff and he did it a little bit but not as much as I should I would have liked him to do more of that um but you know like at the end of the day it, like I said it was a convincing win um and in, in our in our opinion, uh, so as as many predicted, uh, Robert did try to wrestle more, um, and I thought didn't have a lot of success. If you know anything about scoring MMA fights, a takedown doesn't get you. I mean, unless you're doing damage, once you actually take someone to the ground, it's pretty much nothing. Um, there was one point where I thought it was really impressive, where he almost you know got Izzy's back, and Izzy escaped and. Uh, you know, this the 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 former kickboxer who everyone said had no ground game. Overall, can you assess how Izzy did on the mat in the grappling exchanges with the wrestling? Yeah, no, I'm very happy with the. I mean, the the scrambling. I'm very happy with the scrambling. So, I mean, in my gym, like we we just that's that's part of what we do is we do a lot of work on scrambling. I was very happy with. Um, Israel, Israel scrambling. I would have obviously liked him not to let um, let 
Robert get the hooks in and stuff. But and then again, like another big part of what we do is we practice for scenarios like that, and he dealt with it perfectly. I mean, Robert wasn't really like, did he take advantage of any of those takedowns? And in, in, in my opinion, like, um, not not really. There was very little damage um, taken as a result of those takedowns. It, it, like, it was from what I saw. And then, um, I mean, obviously, my opinion doesn't count. But the only the only opinions that count are the three judges, and mm-hmm. and uh, they obviously thought something very similar. So he wins the fight. All seems good. Um, at the very end, there w- I was I was a little concerned because in the middle of the fight, I don't know. Have you watched the fight at all? Have you guys watched it back? I, nah, I think Israel has. I haven't watched it yet, Ariel. Sorry. Okay, I just wanted to ask you about one thing. I mean, you would know about it, but in the middle of the fight. Um, John Anik mentions that he gets a text from Joe Rogan, who wasn't there, that he thought Rogan thought that Izzy broke his hand, and then and then Izzy was asked about it. Um, Cormier asked about it, and he was like, "No, nah, this is what I do. There's no broken hand, right? Just to be clear, he did not break his hand. He did not injure his hand in the middle of that fight. There was nothing wrong with the right hand." Nah, nah, that's more <laughs> to do with um, okay. no, nah, not at all. That that. That was actually something to do that I addressed as early as round two, three, and four, um, trying to get that right hand side going. Um, but for whatever reason, Israel, for whatever reason, Robert was making Israel a little anxious to throw, um, not just the right hand, but the right side. So I managed to get the right side in terms of the leg going a little bit, but I wasn't able to get the right side in terms of the upper body moving the way I should. And uh, there was a block there that I tried to kind of um, mitigate my way through each round, but I just, for whatever reason, me and him weren't able to successfully get that right hand going the way we wanted to. So it wasn't about a broken hand or anything. It was uh, it was up here, yeah. Okay, I like it. Um, the leg kicks were a big part of the attack. I'm, I'm assuming that was part of the game plan, right? Not something that he saw in the moment. You guys, uh, you know, you plan on doing that. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, like, uh, um, set, yeah, setting up the lead kicks, like um, putting Robert's body in certain positions where uh, it gave us the lead kick. It's like, obviously, at this level, like, everybody knows how to block a kick, but right. uh, the set up and the putting push putting the fighter in certain positions so you can actually land the lead kick, that was a big part of our game plan. I, I thought it was super interesting, but not surprising that uh, Izzy showed up as early as he did to the arena to uh I think it was to support his his teammates. Now did he go to the arena and then go back home or did he stay there the whole time? And either way, were you in favor of him doing that? Because that's a long time to be kind of, you know, in the back and all that stuff. I mean it's like seven hours later. So what did what happened and and were you in favor as opposed to him just like staying at home and going whenever it was time to go? Uh, that the, I mean, that, that kid can deal with anything. Um, yeah. uh, like he's had, he's had near 100 fights and he's had the strangest scenarios happen to him before a fight that you can even think of. So I was happy with whatever he wanted to do. I knew he was going to come and support the guys. Um, that I think I think it's part of – I think he loves it. I think it's part of his build-up to kind of ride the emotions of his team. It's kind of like – it's almost prepares him mentally for what's coming for him, and um, I think he deals with it very well. He took his, he, I mean, he took his blanket and his pillow. I mean, I can put up a photo, send you a photo later, and he's like uh, fast asleep, and we're just all sitting around just doing what we do. So, I mean, they, they got you, that kid can that kid can sleep anywhere. Um, yeah, he was fast asleep, like properly properly asleep for for two or three hours at least. Wow! So he just stayed at the arena. Stayed at the arena the whole time, yeah. Wow. Uh, and and him walking out and visualizing everything uh, beforehand, that this was caught on camera, like going through. I've been in the arena when they go through the rehearsals of the main event walkouts and whatnot. I've never seen a fighter actually be a part of it. Like the actual fighter who they're doing, it's usually like, you know, the production people doing it. He actually was the, the fill-in for Izzy. He himself was the fill-in. Is that something he has always done? Or was it... Did he notice they were doing it, and then uh, you know the act? I know going in the ring or the cage is a thing, but like going through the full walkout, has he always done that? He's big on visualization, and he's he's. I think for a lot of for a lot, if not all of his fights, he's visualizes 
how the fight will go from that minute he steps out into the lights, and uh, he's always done that. Um, and 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 recent times, going back to Melbourne, the, actually going back to the first fight, that's when I first noticed him asking the UFC if he could get out there and do the full workout, walk and his full routine. And I think he might have done that ever since. Wow! Um, if he's been able to be, be granted access, so yeah, I did see him. That was on actually the closed circuit TV. Um, uh, TV that they had at the arena. So I saw. Um, we didn't. We didn't even know he'd gone. Like we just looked over and he was gone. Wow. He left with a bunch of the guys, and then we just saw him up on the camera, um, facing off with one of the sound people. I think he was there. Yes. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. Um, did you have a chance to? I mean, obviously a lot was going on, but did you see Jared Cannonier's fight at all? Um, I did. I did. I did see. Little bits and pieces of it, yeah, I did actually. What do you think? It was a terrific fight. I, I like I, I Brunson was looking very, very good. I uh, thought Brunson the game plan was um, superb. I thought, uh, but I, you know, like Jared Cannonier, like you can have you can have everything going your way against Jared Cannonier. You can have the perfect game plan and they have a great strategy, but um, I think Jared Cannonier is one of those guys that can turn the fight in the blink of an eye, right? So that's essentially what happened, but um, I thought he was losing before that. Mm, me too. Um, is he is he next for Izzy? Uh, you reckon? I don't know. I'm asking Could you. Be. <laughs> who yeah. else? Who else yeah. is there? <clears throat> Uh, well, this, I mean, I've already... Don't tell me Darren Till this. again, you coach. I mean, come on. <laughs> kill me if you say that. I, I got this devious little manager that I le- work very, very closely with who manages another person who speaks, who, who talks a lot. Yeah. And, you know, who's very controversial. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, maybe this devious little manager is trying to take advantage of a situation of both managing both two fighters. Ah, oh, Timothy. Uh, <laughs> Would you be okay uh, with that? Do you think that uh, that Sean has has earned that shot? Uh, um, no, I think I think Jared's in, in probably the best position, but um, Jared shouldn't, you know, like Jared and his team. They they still got to, you know, there's still some work to be done. There's still some business to be sorted out, and um Sean Strickland's on five or six fight win streak and Jared's on two I believe so Jared's got the higher higher position but um you know like nothing's ever safe and it's not my job to make you know like Jared Cannonier's team um feel safe and give you know tell them that everything's cheery and stuff so yeah there's still there's still many things that could still happen in this game and uh you got to get you got to get your name on that dotted line Yep. and then uh, and then you know it's signed, sealed, and delivered. So um, you, you I, I heard I, Timothy did mention he's coming on. Yeah, yeah. And I would like you to really put him through the ringer on this one. And wow. Make, I want you to make make his interview a little tougher than he usually. You're always very nice to Tim, and I think <laughs> quit being nice to him. Um, <laughs> oh, well, this is he's a- not as he's not as nice a guy as you make him out to be. I, R- I, I would really. You got to. Quiz him out about quiz him on about that contract, that contract, all the all the questions that I couldn't answer. Okay. And then I want you to talk about Sean Strickland. And um you can even talk about um Jack Jack Hermanson, because I think he's managing too many middleweights. Wow. So there's a conflict of interest, is what you're saying. There's a bit of a con like whose side is he on? You want loyalty. You want just one middleweight on the roster. I think so. I think so. You're saying that Tim is one of the bad guys in this business, not one of the I thought he was one of the good guys. If he's if he's managing one of if he's managing one of our opponents, then yeah, that is weird. You got to make a choice. Which, which side? Which side is he on? Right? Okay. <laughs> okay, I can't wait to ask him that. He'll be on the show on Wednesday, so I will ask him that. Um, all right, so that's interesting. You just threw me a curveball. I'll mention this to Jared. He'll be up uh, on the show as well later on. So uh, you're not on. So you don't know any of this because you're not you're not on social media at all, right? You have no Twitter, no Instagram. <clears throat> I don't have social media. Um, at all, and I hundred percent one of the one of the best things I've found is especially after a fight is to just stay off the internet because mm-hmm. it's a it's a terrible it's a terrible place. <laughs> yes, have you always had it? Uh, have you always believed in that, or did, was there a point where you did have social media? 
No, nah, I've always, I've never been, you know, I've never gravitated towards social media. I definitely think it's one of the most terrible things on this planet at the moment. Do you try to get your fighters not to use it? There was a stage way back then when I thought I could convince them that it's also the most terrible thing in the world. But then the world the world changes fast, Ariel. Yes. And, uh, you know, the part of the modern game is you have to have a – the higher your profile you, you can get, the, the better it is for you. So it's it's easy for not going to London, but okay. I can have, have some business over there. But All right. If, do, if we do run into Darren Till, we're going to try and get him that win because yeah, yeah. maybe he can leapfrog, maybe he can leapfrog Strickland. Um, and Kananir. Right. You never know. Yeah, all he needs is one win. We've been trying to get him that win for a couple of years. You just need that one win, and then you <laughs> could justify it. Uh, will you be in London with Dan Hooker? I, 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 yes, I will be. I will be. I'm going to go. Um, that's why I'm trying to get home, because those guys are in their camp. I'll go from London. I'll go to London with Dan, and then I'll fly straight across, straight across to Kaikara's fighting Askarov in mm-hmm. Columbus, and then... I'll rush home maybe to Sydney and I'll do Volk. Volk will be preparing for um, the zombie and that'll be in Jacksonville um, mm-hmm. soon after that. So busy, busy next few weeks. And uh, and I'm going to let you go in a second because I know you have to, to head out, but um, Blood Diamond, obviously it didn't go his way. Carlos, it did <laughs> go his way. Carlos Alberg, can I just get your thoughts mm-hmm. on uh, Blood Diamond's debut and uh, – how you? I mean, obviously, it didn't go his way, but how you felt about it? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm very, very, very disappointed. Um, um, and Bloods is even more disappointed. It's been a very, very emotional couple of, you know, last couple of days for um, Blood Diamond. But um, it, when you lose like that, um, you know, and we, I've had a few fighters that have lost like that. Dan Hooker's lost like that. When you just get caught early and you don't, get a chance to show the people in the world what you're capable of. Um, it's, 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 it's heart wrenching. It's really heart wrenching, but um, look, this sometimes happens. And uh, we all know that blood diamonds are world-class uh, fighter. And uh, you said in similar fashion to what happened to Olberg, uh, Carlos Olberg, he has to just come back from this and prove it. He has to prove it. He has to prove it to the world. Is to prove it to the UFC and has to prove it, you know, to Sean Shelby that um, he deserves to be where he is. So is he back in June, right? That's the hope? No, we're definitely going to take June. Like, we want to try and get – look, fighting in June is not going to get us five fights, but fighting in June will possibly get us four this right this year. Because when he said that, I got a lot of people, right, you know, they, they sent me all this hate mail on, uh, well, hate tweets, I should say, social media. Like we said, toxic place. I thought you said he was going to fight five times. Well, I, I was like, well, first of all, I didn't say that. And second of all, I mean, what do you want me to say? That's what he said, June. He said June. So, I mean, you to your point, you can get three, four, but in a perfect world, would you prefer earlier than June? We could go earlier, but um, we've been informed that um, – there's just, there's just no dates available for us. Okay. And this is what I mean. Like to get five is a big ask. Like a big, to get five needs complete cooperation from, from um, the UFC. And, and as you know, this deal had just happened in the final hour. So, yeah. um, you know, we, we, we would have to look at doing that next year. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. I hope you guys get. Did you get the French toast, by the way? Did you have it from the Rock? Did you try some? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. Man. Oh thanks, my god! Thanks to the Rock for that. I was so <laughs> jealous. I mean, when he put the fork in, and it just like all like it was so soft, like a pillow. Oh, it looked amazing, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Um, Coach, I know you have to go to the airport, so thank you so much for the time. Yeah. I appreciate it. Safe travels to you, and congratulations on the big night Saturday night. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank all right, you very much. take care. There he is, Coach Eugene Behrman who is the head man over at City Kickboxing in New Zealand. Big, big win for him in the main event. Unfortunately, as uh, as you know, when there's multiple fighters on a card, it's sometimes not going to be the three-peat that they have been used to in the past. Uh, Blood Diamond lost his UFC debut. Carlos Alberg got back on track with a win. And Izzy, obviously, the big one in the main event. He mentioned something in there about uh, Israel in New York later in the week. And then I was thinking, wow, we're in New York. 
we do this show in New York. And then I was thinking about all the people who are sending me, you know, mean tweets uh, over the last couple of days about how, you know, Izzy doesn't like me anymore and he's not on the show before the fight. He's not on the show after the fight. So I don't know. I was just, you know, I was just thinking that maybe it would be fun. I don't you know. Maybe just like a good time to reminisce and whatnot, you know, just one of those. Um, but in any event, I thought it was uh, an entertaining fight. I was talking to a uh, a friend of mine who is a newer MMA fan. He was like, ah, oh, it was too boring. There was too much stalling. There was too much this and that. I mean, this is this is high level, the highest of high levels in MMA. Robert Whitaker, to, to not think that that fight was good or interesting is to not understand how good Robert Whitaker is. And Robert Whitaker is really good as a middleweight. Uh, he beats everyone except Izzy. He, um, he had looked good in his last few fights. He obviously didn't look good in the first fight. He had evolved. And I really thought, again, I'm not, but I, I think I said on the show, I'm not the guy who makes picks. I make them internally. But the one pick that I was very comfortable in making was this fight's going the distance. I just didn't see Izzy knocking him out. And I just didn't see Robert knocking out Izzy. And in the end, it went the distance. And in the end, I thought the right guy won. Now, the scorecards were a little bit all over the place. Uh, they all kind of got to the same place. But uh, there was a lot of dissension there in terms of how they got to the same place. But now we've got an interesting situation where uh, Israel is uh, still the champ. He's undefeated at middleweight. He just signed this new long-term deal with the UFC. And you can tell in his answers, and I'm curious as this fighter pay discussion continues to grow and grow, you could tell with some of his comments, and I'd love to ask him about it, this as well, it sounds like he could be one of those first guys who doesn't just say, all right, I got mine, and I'm just going to go sit over here and do my thing. Sounds like, at least from the comments that I saw and 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 heard and you know read before the fight and especially after the fight one of those guys who will get his as he has but is now as a result of that going to try and make a difference and what do i mean by that allow there to be a trickle down effect and that's always what needed to happen first the people at the very top who have the most influence and the biggest voice and who are on the highest platform um, they are the ones that can make some some noise. They could change some things. Now, historically, the ones at the very, very top, uh, you know, have changed maybe certain things for themselves, but not for others. And I wonder if Izzy's going to be able to do that, if he's interested in doing that. It seems to me like he's interested. And that, to me, is the most interesting part of this new deal that he signed. Because if he's going to be that guy, then that's huge for the sport. And you can tell based on his personality, he's comfortable being that guy. He's okay being that guy. So I saw some people saying like, oh, you know, he could have took a, a, a stand with Francis, his African brother. He's going through all this stuff. Like, you know, here he is. No, I, I, don't, I don't think it necessarily works that way. In fact, I think that Francis' situation was a, a, a byproduct of Izzy sighing, not so much for Izzy's reasons, but I thought the UFC couldn't afford to have Israel go into the final fight of his contract with one fight left as champion, right? Final fight of his contract, one fight left, champion. Can't do that. Can't risk that, in my opinion, because we just went through that and we saw how that went, right? We saw how that, went, how that went. So I think that they they needed to wrap that up before this fight. And they did. If the Francis situation didn't happen as it did, maybe there wasn't the same type of, or wouldn't have been the same type of sense of urgency to wrap it up, to not risk going into the final fight of his deal as champion. Um, but I think just coming off the Francis situation, I, I personally, this is just my assessment. No one's told me this. It's just me kind of surveying the landscape and, and kind of knowing how good his deal is because it is a very good deal for MMA, you know, fighters. 
Um, I feel like there's a connection there. We'll see. Now, his next opponent could very well be our next guest. In a matter of moments, hopefully, we're going to be joined uh, by Jared Cannonier, who had that big win over uh, Derek Brunson on Saturday. Uh, I thought that it was a fight where Brunson won the first round, as it seems like Eugene Behrman did as well. And then I thought uh, Brunson got really tired in the second round, super tired and super sloppy. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, wow, uh, this is Cannoneer's fight all of a sudden. There's a huge opening here. And then it became like, oh, wow, Cannoneer's uh, going to finish this fight in the second round. And he did with some vicious elbows. Holy smokes. And while he was throwing down those elbows, in fact, uh, Robert, not Robert Whitaker, Derek Brunson's team uh, actually threw in the towel, which isn't something that we see very often in uh, in the UFC. I, I remember when uh, Diaz's team threw in the towel, Nathan Diaz's team threw in the towel uh, during the Josh Thompson fight. Um, referee didn't even see it on Saturday, so it didn't even matter. But I thought it was just like an interesting thing that happened. Um, in the end, though, it was very clear the fight needed to end and Jared Cannonier wins his second in a row, his uh, fifth in the last sixth, and this could be the one that finally gets him that title shot. Without further ado, let's say hello now to the killer gorilla himself, Jared Cannonier. There he is, Jared. How are you, sir? Congratulations. I'm doing good, Ariel. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, th thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, so a lot to talk to you about here. Uh, could I ask, you know, you, you have that first round, and he's a much different fighter in the second round. All of a sudden, it seemed like he got super, super tired. It seemed like, you know, if this was a video game, he was going down to zero. Were you noticing that as well? And and why do you think he got tired so quickly? Well, man, he shot 13 shots in that fight. That's a lot of that's a lot of takedowns. He, he uh, was successful on three, but wasn't able to capitalize on, you know, do any damage or do anything big. He threw that rear naked choke on it at the last seconds of the first round but um nothing for me to really concern myself with uh i felt fine but that's a lot of takedowns on top of that i was in his face the whole time applying pressure smart patient pressure um and uh you know he was doing his best to keep me away from him so that he can get in close safely but uh um that's usually how it goes when god it's hard to fight off of your heels you get tired faster um, you're not really in control of what's going on in the octagon. You're sort of reacting and waiting for openings and opportunities. So um, it's sort of like a uh, a fight or flight sort of thing on his on his uh, on his side of the uh, <laughs> the cage, if you will. And that is exhausting mentally and physically. So I think <clears throat> that's what it was. He felt the pressure from the start. He was trying to get those takedowns. They weren't exactly. They weren't all successful. And uh, it's a lot of energy he expended. So I think that's what it was. So safe to assume that um, even though he may have won that first round, you weren't sweating it going to the second. You you kind of felt really confident that this was going to go in your favor despite that because of all the energy that he was exerting and because of how you were fighting. I wasn't really thinking about the first round after the first round ended. You know, it happens. You put that stuff in the past and you get right back to, you know, business at hand, which is winning the fight. So that was the... That was it. I didn't really concern myself with how the first round went. Um, had it gone to the third round, then that's when I would start making considerations on what what do I got to do in this round to to win the fight. But um, I, you know, I, it is what it is. I got a good feel of him in that first round. He was slowing down in that second time, in that second round, which would have made which made it even easier to uh, to get my game plan going, get some strikes off, get moving around on him, and. Uh, Find those openings, I guess. For someone who's never been in that spot before, can you even put into words like what it is like hitting a man with elbows like that and then just kind of seeing their body? I mean, like he just goes out. And so I would imagine like there's no resistance anymore. What, what does that feel like when you're dropping elbows like that on an opponent who's about to go out? Uh, it, man, it happened so fast. It was a punch and like three elbows. And it happened so fast. It was just... You didn't really feel you don't really feel the impact or anything. You just feel the uh that slight resistance, his head bounced off the elbow. So, you know, his, his head gave way to the force that I was uh, bringing down on him. Um 
You know, my elbow's kind of sore afterwards, but uh, wow, it's hard to uh, really say what it feels like. It was just, I was just doing going through the motions, I guess. His team threw in the towel, but it didn't really matter, obviously, because the ref was just about to stop the fight anyway. Uh, would you like to see more of that in MMA? We don't really see that often in our sport. We see it in boxing quite a bit, but not really in MMA. Um, usually, I mean, the finish comes in so many different ways in MMA, and it can come fast or it can be like a long, drawn-out thing. Um, whereas in other sports like boxing, you know, the damage is, di- is more, usually directly toward, directed towards the brain, which is why guys will throw in the towel to save the brain. Um, as far as MMA, you know, you got joint locks, chokes, kicks. You can finish a fight with body shots, you know, leg uh, leg kicks and stuff like that. Um, so uh, in that position, yeah, um, it was definitely smarter to the corner to throw the towel in if the ref wasn't going to be there to stop it. If Brunson would have been able to uh, stave off some of those attacks, but not all of them, it would it was still damaging, you know. Uh, I hit him with the elbow standing, and that definitely and that definitely rocked him. Um, he was on Chris Street the whole time. Um, the fact that I was able to just take him down with a with a wizard and head control, um, letting this corner know that hey, he's not there right now. And then as soon as I started laying it down, I was like, no, nope, he's done. So uh, the corner truck did did their best to try to save him as soon as possible. Um, unfortunately, those three elbows were super effective. Uh, and you know, ultimately, I hope Derek Brunson's. I hope Derek's brain is okay. You know, uh, I'm just there to defeat the body. I don't want to like give him any lasting damage or anything. The man has a family at home, and I want him to be able to go over there and and, and be with them and be you know the normal Derek, the one that the one that they saw leave for fight week, and the one I want that to be the same one to come back. You know, after the fight. So, but you know, this is a hurt business. It is what we. It is what we do. It's the name of the game. And it's the risk that we all sign up for. So um, I did my job. The ref did his. And Derek definitely did his. So, um, you know, it, it is. It is what it is. Obviously, this was a big fight with potentially big stakes. Dana White stopped short at saying this was a number one contender fight at the press conference on Thursday. But everyone was kind of thinking this was. Did you feel any extra pressure, any extra nerves? Because you knew that you were so close to finally getting that, that shot if you uh, had a big performance. No, it was just about being Derek. It didn't matter who or what was going on before or after. It was just only about winning that fight. Um, it's always only about winning the fight. You know, even when uh, it was a little bit of pressure when I fought Robert, but I, I wouldn't say it was pressure that, that inhibited my performance. I think it was the broken arm that sort of inhibited my performance against against Robert. But um, no, no pressure. Business as usual, man. Everybody's there's always going to be that pressure. There's always going to be the fans and the uh, analysis and everybody. Everybody's you know everybody's an analysis when it comes to this sport, right? Right. With this social media thing. So um, everybody's got their opinions, and I don't listen to now one of them, especially now after the fight's over, and there's the uh, uh, prospect of me fighting Izzy. You know, there are those who support me, but there are those who you know who think that I don't have a chance and blah 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 blah. I'm not listening to that. I'm not. Even, I'm trying to not even look at it. If I see anything that has a hint of negativity, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm not even going to give it the energy it needs to survive, which is attention. I'm not going to give any of that shit attention. So, um, it, you know, that is what it is. If you come into my, if you come into my feed, tagging me with that negative shit, I'm playing this up. I'm gonna block you, man. I ain't got no time for that bullshit. Y'all just slinging hate, slinging venom, and y'all ain't got the courage to do it your damn self. So everybody's just a bunch of cowards and pussies behind these keyboards. I, I, hey, man. So I didn't got no time to to really entertain them. I feel you on that. It's get it's too much. I can't imagine the type of person that would write to a fighter after a fight some negative stuff about you know like that to me blows my mind that they would actually go out of their way to write some stuff about you. You walked into a cage, and in your case, like you beat up, you finished a guy who was on fire, and still write negative things. I don't know what kind of stuff you got, but if someone is writing you that stuff. That's an absolute maniac. I mean, that is just a crazy person. Yeah, I've seen some stuff, but I haven't. I don't look at it all. I'm not even. I mean, my my phone is full of notifications that I keep clearing out and stuff like that. Some good, some bad. So a lot of the good stuff I'm missing. I'm sorry, guys. I would love to uh, give you guys my gratitude for your support and all that stuff, but I'm not gonna. I'm not putting my energy into this into this device that's trying to suck my energy out of me. Amen. Um, 
yeah, anybody who who does that is a very low frequency, low vibrational individual. They they thrive and strive off of that negative the negative aspects of this reality that we live in. All they want to do is talk down on people. They don't want to lift nobody up. They don't want to see a better world. They want to. They're living in a world of shit, just like uh, uh, Lawrence Leonard Lawrence from uh, what's that movie called? Full Metal Jacket. They just live. They're 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 living in a world of shit, and they're just waiting to go off the deep end. And they're just a bunch of pussies that can't take it. So fuck them. Hey, I love it. I love it. Uh, did you watch Aziz fight? I saw it for the most part. I mean, I was in the back doing a whole bunch of things, going from one place to another. I saw the tail end of it, uh, the last three, four rounds, which is more than the tail end of it. Yeah. But um, it's hard, man. After fights, it's hard to watch another fight and really be and study it, watch it with, a, with an analytical eye. So um, I was definitely watching. I watched it. and um, But, you know, we were going from place to place, so I couldn't really sit down and watch. So I'm waiting to get back home and give it to the team, and we're going to start studying and figuring out what we're going to, what we got to do to get the victory in that one. Could I ask, though, uh, of what you saw, what did you think of his performance? Because, you, I mean, you know you know Whitaker well. You've been in there with him. You've obviously watched Izzy. What, what did you think of his performance, of what you saw? I thought Izzy looked just as good as he always does, you know? Very smart, tactical, technical. Um, and his corner is, you know, his corner is always there. They're always there to uh, reinforce his ability. So um, it's a, it's a dream team is what it is, you know? Uh, but again, I'd have to watch it again with a more analytical eye to see all the small things, the small uh, vari- variances in the fight that go on. Um, I, I hear a lot of people think it went the other way, but um, I agree with him in his, in his, co- in his pro fight press conference. You got to take the belt. You can't do enough to, to, you know, you can't just do enough or do what you think is enough. As far as championship fights, I feel you got to go in there and, and take it. So, um, yeah, um, but I don't know. Um, I, again, I have to go back and watch it. That's fair. Um, have you or your management team been told you are definitively next as a result of your win on Saturday? No. Um, only thing I've heard is uh, Dana sort of kind of agreeing to it in his post fight press front press conference yeah he sort of gave me the nod and the smile when i was in the cage getting his attention and all that stuff um we'll see what happens you know um izzy also uh threw me an alley-oop there so uh hopefully that that that's enough to uh you know have them guys send me that contract but uh we'll see you'd be down with june he says he wants to return in june i'm assuming that's okay with you yeah yeah why not yeah you um, know? so i'm ready for five fights by the way, when Five you rounds. when you were in the in the uh, the um, the press con- uh, not the press conference in the cage post fight interview, and you were like, I'm not trying to start anything here, but you kept saying like, Dana, listen to me, listen to me. You had to. What was he doing? They didn't show like what. He, somebody he, was somebody was talking to him. God. Somebody was sitting there talking to him, and it was taking his attention away from the, from what I was trying to say. To yeah, him. So, what uh, the hell? I ended up getting his attention. I ended up looking him in his eye, and I told him what I had to say, and uh, he was like, <laughs> he was you know entertained it at the least are, are are you feeling confident that this is what's going to happen because you know i just had uh izzy's head coach on eugene Berman, and he was like you know there's strickland out there too you know a little non-committal do you think that you got it or do you think you're gonna have to fight for it i'd say that i know that i earned it mm-hmm. but if they choose strickland over me that would say something mm-hmm. to me you know, it could be my ego thinking, it could be my ego on my shoulder telling me, oh, they scared of you. They don't want that heat just yet. But um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, but I can't really say that for sure. Those guys are smart, you know. But what, you know, um, <laughs> Easy gets to, apparently Easy gets to pick his fights. And he did say my name in that post fight. Yeah. Press, in, the, in the post fight interview and in the press conference. And it's been, you know, it's been in the making. So uh, I would say that I'm confident that it's going to happen, but uh, I'm just going to stay prepared for anything. Yeah, he's been talking about you for a while now, for like for well over a year. Yeah. So I, f- I feel like it's going to happen. It's the fight. I mean, to be honest, it's the fight that happens. It's the fight that should happen. Anybody who's mentioned Sean Strickland, number seven, who just beat number nine, or was it number six? Mm-hmm. Or number six? I don't know how that how the number rankings go, but um. Uh, you know, I beat number nine and Kevin Gastelum. Then nobody gave me a title shot after that. 
you know. Um, but <clears throat> who knows, man? I know that I am the one. Like I said, anybody can say out of out of the if they look at the landscape, the top ten, Cannoneer, who's coming off of a finish, who's beating, who just beat a streaking opponent. Um, I think I, I feel like I, if I was a fan, just a fan, I would say Cannoneer's next. I wouldn't say give him Batori again, who who just lost the title. You know what I'm saying? Um, and the third rematch with Robert. I mean, that's that's no, they're not going to possible. Do I mean, it's it's it's, it's like it's like it's likely, but I don't know. No, they're not going to do that. I'd be shocked if they did that. I, I I think you got it. And and Dana is actually in the past like usually he's non-committal about these things and I thought he was more committal than usual in the post fight press conference. So I, I think you got it. By the way, you made your debut June of 2011. If someone would have told you, let's say this fight happens June of 2022, if someone would have told you it's going to take you 11 years to get to a title fight in the UFC. Was that what you were like? You, did you know you were in this for the long haul, or was there a part of you who was like, "Oh man, I'm going to be fighting for belts"? You know, three, four, five, six years in. No, again, when I when I when I got on this road to uh, uh when I got into this sport, I told I told myself I'm going to go as far as I can, and this is as far as I've come so far, and I've got further to go because I know I'm better than I know I'm getting better. So um. This is as far as I've come, and and I've never put a stamp on. This is as far as I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna go as far as I can go, and that and that potential. And with that, I like to uh, lean on potential. There's a potential for greatness, and uh, that's what I'm going for. Mm. Um, last time we spoke after your last win, you know, I gave you a lot of credit for this. You were very vocal about finances and whatnot. I uh, just wanted to ask you a follow up to that. Did you receive any kind of hate for that? Any type of heat for that? You know, some people don't like talking about these things. Some people are uncomfortable talking about these things. You were vocal and I thought very eloquent, but I'm curious if you received any sort of backlash for that. Not from nobody who mattered. Okay. You know? no, yeah, that's what I meant. If from anything, people who mattered. If any, yeah. Well, if anything, I got a new contract. So this <laughs> is my first fight on my new contract. Oh, wow. So uh, yeah. it actually pays to speak up sometimes. I mean, I think that was, I mean the fight with uh, with Gassim, I believe. Well, that was the last fight on my yeah. contract. Okay, it was the second to last fight, but it was time. It was close to the time for renewal. I had already talked to my manager back that before the Gassim fight that um, you know, we could be potentially able to renew our contract or do, you know renew a contract and stuff like that. So this was the first fight on that contract, um, and um, everybody thinks that I that. You know, everybody goes back to that and say that I was com complaining to the UFC about my pay. I'm like, no, I would never, I've never complained to the UFC because I'm the one who who voluntarily signed the contract. They didn't make me sign those contracts or anything like that. All the thing I said is that, yeah, I feel that us being a major organization on ESPN and all that stuff, athletes, UFC athletes should definitely get paid the same way that NFL, NBA athletes should, or compensated to a certain degree because, um. You know, injuries, families, all that kinds of stuff. Yeah. But you know. <laughs> yeah. Is this is this new deal much better? Are you happy with it? Well, the deals only get better, right? I mean, yeah. at least the numbers get higher. <laughs> yeah, but is it like a significant so, uh, increase or is it just like a small increase? Oh yes. Yeah, it's, it's just I was consider it significant. It's okay. um if I were to put a percentage on it. Uh, shit. I can't even, I can't do the math right now, but it's a good increase. Okay. And so do you feel more comfortable about things? Because it did seem like here you are fighting in the main event on ESPN and you were talking about how, you know, you were kind of, you were kind of struggling there for a second. So do you, do you feel like yeah. this has eased things up? Are you more comfortable now? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm all, I've always been comfortable, you know, um, Again, my my the, the thing is is we only get paid when we fight. Right. So um, you know, you got other guys out there doing all kinds of things. You know, they're a part of the rat race, scrambling for money. They call it hustling, but I call it you're on the hamster wheel, you know. Um so you know, it's about perspective. I look at the, I look at things differently than most other people. And um but um, you know, uh only thing the only thing I'm doing is training and fighting. That's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, 
you know, I could do other things and, and I have plans for my future. But at this point in time, all I'm doing is training and fighting. That's all I want to do. And uh, I'm able to take care of my family through that alone. Okay. Which is the whole reason why I quit my six-figure job in Alaska. Because I'm getting six figures here in the UFC. So people don't, I don't want people thinking that, oh, he's not getting paid. You know, people hear that six-figure number and they start being, you know, they get, start seeing dollar signs and Louis bags and dumb shit like that. But um, <laughs> that's not what it's about for me. Um, it's all about being able to take care of myself, take care of my family. I'm trying to attain sovereignty, independence, and all that kind of good stuff. But um, I'm in a good place as far as my contract and my standing with the UFC. Uh, I would like to be rich. You know, I'm more famous than I am rich. I would like to be more rich than I am famous. So that's the that's what that's where I want to get to. Uh, you beat Israel Adesanya. I think the the other part comes, you know, comes along, right? You become rich and famous. That's the plan. That is the plan. I don't care. Again, I don't care about. I'd rather sure. not be famous. I don't right. need a whole bunch of people who I don't know trying to run up to me, and trying to take some of my energy, get my attention when I could be focusing on bigger and better things. Um, not to talk down on fans or anything. You know, I do appreciate you guys' support. And I'm more than happy to give you guys some of my energy, especially when you guys come with the correct energy. And you get a bunch of weirdos and a bunch of casuals who don't even know who you are, just trying to get just trying to get a piece of that that energy, that cloud or whatever they call it. That's that can that can be annoying. So if you don't know who I am, don't ask me for no picture. Don't ask me for nothing. You know what I'm saying? Do some research, figure out who I am, figure out what type of energy I'm with that I find uh, palatable. And come with that energy. And if you can't come with that energy, I'm, I don't mind giving you a cold shoulder. I don't mind being a dick to a complete stranger. It ain't like you can beat me up. Right. <laughs> That's true. That is. By the way, are you still into the crystals and everything? Yeah, I still do crystals. I mean, that's a that's going to be a thing that I, I'm always going to tap into. It's energy. It's clean energy, not the bullshit that we get a lot of. <laughs> and, and when, yeah, It's not like snake venom. After the fight, you did this. I don't know if you can see me this. What was that? Was that because was that because of your gym or was that for something else? That's the lab symbol. We okay. This triangle, the lab yep. uh, emblem is a triangle in a sort of a spherical or a spiral uh, sort of configuration. And for me, it means mind, body, and spirit. Three things coming together to create. You know what I'm saying? To complete a circle or a triangle, which is a circle in itself, 360 degrees. But um, that that's what it means for me, and it's about balancing those three to create the best version of myself. Yes, I've seen uh, Benson do that as well over the years. Um, yeah. Last thing for you, and then I'll let you go. Thank you for the time, Jared. In your opinion, and and maybe you can't answer this question, but I'm sure you've thought of it. <clears throat> to beat Israel Adesanya, what do you have to do? What is the key to defeating this guy? Um, well, it's gonna be interesting to fight some, if, you know, if that fight happens, to fight somebody who's not gonna be diving for my legs every second. Every mm -hmm. time, you know, they feel pressure, they're going to be shooting for the legs. So it's going to be fun fighting another striker. Um, I will really get to let my uh, my skills show in that in this fight, you know. Um, all these other guys have only ever tried to shoot on me because they don't want to, they can't go with me skill for skill on the, on, 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 the, on the feet. So this will be a good opportunity to showcase my true skills as a striker. Um, people have only seen me they only see me as like this big powerful guy who can hit you with one shot and it can hurt and all that good stuff. But, um, uh, th my opponent will usually bring out the best of me and is he being the caliber fighter? He is the type of fighter, the, the striker that he is, I feel is going to bring out a better version of my striking as well. So, um, but not only that, I have to be good everywhere. I mean, I'm gonna give him looks everywhere. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not like, uh, I'm good everywhere. So wherever the fight goes, um, I know one thing, if he ends up on the bottom, it may not last too long. So uh, <laughs> I may end up taking that into this fight. I'm not saying I'm going to be shooting for his hips. We're going to fight. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to throw some bunches at his face. I'm going to throw some punches at his bottom. I'm going to definitely kick his legs out from underneath him. So um, he's going to do the same. Um, but um, it's going to be... It's going to be a good fight, that's for sure. That's, all, that's the only thing I can say right now. I love it. And I hope it happens, and I think it will happen. And I think you bring a uh, a fresh set of challenges to uh, to Izzy. I think it's going to be a really interesting fight. I hope it happens in, uh, in June. Thank you, as always, for the time, Jared. Congrats on an amazing win, a super impressive win over a really tough veteran on Saturday. 
Uh, I like the uh, the Blood Brunson line. That was good. Good on the mic, man. You've come a long way on the mic as well. You're really great on the mic too. So keep up all the great work and uh, thanks for joining me as always. Hey, man, I appreciate it. And I also want to give a shout out to my sponsors, uh, uh, Cam and Bill with Thrival. Um, I definitely uh, carry it with me. It's going to be with me every five weeks and I love that piece of equipment. I use it for, I use it damn near every day. What is um, it? So shout out to Thrival. It's a Thrival muscle release board. You guys probably look on my page and, okay, yeah. and see the stuff on it. Yep. Um, oh, I can't remember my promo code. I think it's Killer Gorilla. But anyway, I'll have to put that out there. Um, also shout out to uh, Clover K9 for looking after my dogs, for boarding my, not only just boarding my dogs, but also uh, getting some getting some good obedience training in with them as well while we're, while I'm away. Um so uh, if you guys are in Phoenix and you have a dog, an unruly animal that needs to learn some respect, <laughs> <laughs> send him to Clover K9. He will definitely teach him how to put some respect on your name and uh, that amongst other things. And last but not least, I also want to thank Crystal Council for always hooking me up with the with the, uh, you know, with some good stones, good crystals, good energy, as always. I love it. Some unconventional sponsors. This is good. Good for you, Jared. Well done. Uh, congrats on the new deal as well. That's uh, that's really great to hear. Thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate it. All right. I'll talk to you soon. There he is. Jared Cannoneer, in my opinion, the new number one contender at 185 pounds. A big win for him on Saturday against a, a guy in Derek Brunson who was looking really good as of late. He said he turned Blonde Brunson into Blood Brunson. And if you look at his last few wins... You got the TKO win over David Branch. You got the win over Anderson Silva. Remember that back in May of 2019. You've got the TKO win over Jack Hermanson in September of 2019. And then the unanimous decision loss to Robert Whitaker two Octobers ago or one October. Um, is it two or one? Well, 2020. We haven't hit the second October. In any event, October of 2020, that was the uh, Gaethje Habib card or Habib Gage card. Came back after a long layoff was injured. He mentioned the injured hand, beat Kelvin Gaslam in August, talked about the money, talked about the contract, got a new contract now, and then he beats Derek Brunson. There's no one else. I would do, if it was up to me, uh, I would do Vittori versus Strickland next. I don't care. Good friends, best friends. Those two dudes don't care about that stuff. Do Vittori versus Strickland next. If Strickland gets by that one, he fights the winner of Cannoneer, is he? But Cannoneer should be next. And yes, we will have um, Tim Simpson, who is one of the uh, top managers in the game, manager for the likes of Jack Hermanson, Sean Strickland, Israel Adesanya, Conor McGregor, all these people and more. Um, Leon Edwards, he'll be in studio on uh, Wednesday as well. So Wednesday is going to be a really fun day. But we are in Monday right now. And it is Valentine's Day, so I hope you're all having a great Valentine's Day. One of the big stories this past weekend, of course, this past week, was the retirement of the Happy Warrior. And I said on Saturday that sometimes it doesn't work out this way. Sometimes you have a situation where you don't know that a fighter is going to retire, and they just retire um, after their fight. And you, I don't know, it almost feels like we didn't have a chance to fet that fighter, celebrate that fighter, honor that fighter. In the case of Roxanne Modafferi, who fought Casey O'Neill this past Saturday, she announced it right when this fight was made. And I love that because that means it gave us, you know, two, three months to celebrate her as she was approaching the final fight. And on fight week, she was celebrated, even by the likes of Izzy, who was asked about um, about Roxy from her own Jose Youngs and gave a great answer about that. And on Saturday, you saw, despite the fact that she didn't win, she got a great ovation. She had her moment. She got to speak on the microphone, you know, with Daniel Cormier and all that stuff. It was really nice. It was really, really nice. And so, um, you know, it was great to see all the tweets and all the, you know, the longtime friends and training partners and foes in this business speak about her. Our own Shaheen Al-Shadi wrote an incredible piece talking to some OGs of the fight game um, about how they felt about Roxy. It was really great that uh, despite the fact that the likes of Izzy and, and, and Rob were fighting on this big card that, you know, she was getting just as much attention as all of them. Well-earned, well-deserved, 
And I wanted to have her on the show to talk about what was sure a, uh, I, w- I would imagine a, an emotional weekend for her, an emotional week for her, but she's kind enough to join us after the big weekend. So let's go to the Zoom machine and say hello to the happy warrior, Roxanne Modafferi. There she is. Roxy, how are you? Oh my gosh. You kind of made me cry with all of that. <laughs> oh, <That's> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was exactly as you said, man. It was such an awesome week. Um, you know, I I got a lot of, you know, respect from people and a lot of people celebrating my career. It was really, really cool. And I, it was made me so happy. Was it hard to balance the emotions of all, you know, all these nice things being said about you and all that stuff? And then you have to go out and actually fight someone um, and you know, in the back of your mind, this is it for you. This is your last time doing it. Did you find it tricky at all to balance everything? Um, I don't know about balance, but it was very challenging overall because I, I've had, I have a lot of emotions about it. You know, I'm, I'm happy that I can move on. On the other hand, you know, I'm sad to be leaving, but I'm not having as much fun training MMA anymore. So it's a whole like whirlwind and I'm trying to just take it all in and just focus. And I feel like I've been putting too much pressure on myself lately. Like, oh my gosh, you have to win Mortal Kombat, like aggression. Uh. And like, I kind of wanted to have more fun with this fight. So it was actually nice and a really good thing that people were being so positive about it. Cause I, I want, it actually helped me like enjoy the moment. And I was able to be very clear headed you know, walking to the cage and just feeling everybody's energy. So it, it helped me. And by the way, I'd be remiss if I don't ask you, how are you feeling after the fight? Uh, like I feel good. No major injuries. My face is kind of swelled up. Yeah. Um, cause it, I swell easily when I get punched, but, uh, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm, I feel relieved. And, uh, how'd you feel about your performance? I honestly felt like it was one of my best striking performances. Um, when I fought, I, I kind of came away thinking that I had won. And then um, I was disappointed by the decision. And then when I went home and I watched it last night, um, I could kind of, I felt like I touched her a lot. Like I punched her so much, like my hand was sore. And I was like, man, I have to punch her so much. Um, but then I, I feel like maybe she got more significant strikes. Like she wasn't moving as much from my strikes as I was from hers. So that's probably why the judges like, like, gave it to her. So I was like, all right, I I can accept that. But I was really proud of my performance. I felt really sharp. And um, I felt like I had improved even from my last fight. I felt like all my hard work kind of paid off, except that I didn't get to win. Um, I have some couple of things that I wish I could have done, but um, I threw some of my spinning attacks that I'd wanted to do. Um, I landed a back kick. I landed a kibosh, which is my something that I kind of want to do. And she smiled at me and, right. and then she started yelling and I was like, Oh, she's powering up. This is so cool. Yeah. And I would yell too, but I was breathing too hard. Um, it was cool. Like I really, I, I enjoyed that fight. Like it was good. It was um, good. It was wh- a good one. You said that there were a couple of things that you wish you would have done. Like what? Uh, I wish I could have gotten her to the ground, but I didn't really sense the opportunity. Like she grew like I, as a, an outsider, like, it was impressive how she uh, improved herself leading oh. up to my fight. Like I expected her to charge forward. You know, she tends to like to do that. So I was preparing for that, but instead we both like were better at keeping our distance. Like I didn't feel her c- car coming forward quite so hard. Like I would have shot and taken her down more. And then she stuffed one of my takedowns. Like, all right, she's, she's ready for my takedowns. Um, and so it was kind of a tactical battle and she got me a little bit more, but yeah, I would have liked to taken her, have taken her down, but I didn't really sense the as many chances. Just curious, after the fight was over, because you had so much fun and because you said you felt like you fought well, was there any part of you that's like, ah, I don't want to, I don't want this to end just yet. Maybe I'll do one more. Was there any doubt in your mind? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> just curious how that stuff goes. Were you happy that they gave you the microphone? That doesn't always happen. Yeah, it was nice. It was nice. Um, I wish, man, I, cause Daniel had, uh, interviewed me after my title fight when I lost. And that was one of my most memorable moments because I lost and I was sad, but then the crowd cheered so loudly. Yeah. And then he came over. I was like, man, it's like the same thing. Like I'm still like a fan favorite, but I, I lost, but it was nice that they let me say something. And that was really cool. Um, by the way, when you take the gloves off, do you get them back? Does someone give them to you? I asked my friend Tom Waller the same thing. I'm like, so we put our gloves down. Like, yeah. I still want them. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, you sent someone back to go get them. So I think uh, my fiance or one of my coaches went back into the ring afterwards and, and grabbed them after done. Okay, you have those. Back. Yeah, because I don't want them to just like toss them in the garbage or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, what do you right. think you'll do with those? Um, keep them. 
Okay. Maybe like maybe frame on yeah, yeah. the wall or something. Um, you, you mentioned this, uh, just a couple of minutes ago, and you also mentioned it last week too, in your media about not having as much fun training anymore. When you say that, what do you mean by that? Like you, the grind or something about like the, the sport or like what, what do you mean? Cause it always seems like you're having fun. So when you say that to me, it's, it feels very pronounced in my mind. Like, wow, you are always having fun. Why aren't you having fun? So could you expand on that? What, what aren't you having fun with? or weren't having fun with now that it's over? Well, one was that I started getting headaches after sparring. Mm. So like I was spending most of my day, like stressed out that I was going to get hit and concussed. Mm. And then I finally figured out how to wear headgear and like that problem got better. But then like people like pull on it and I get stuck and I, I want to do jujitsu, but like my head gets pinned. Um, the other time it was funny. I was training with Lauren Murphy. She visited me. She kind of, I, she had me in jujitsu. We're doing jujitsu in our sparring and she had me like almost in, in an arm bar almost like I was on top and she was under, but I, she didn't have my arm, but she was pushing on my headgear and the strap was like, like choking me. Oh. So like, it was funny, but it sucked. And then just people go really hard these days and like young people just kind of like, I'm, I want to train this one move that we learned in class and someone else is doing a different move and like muscling me around. And I'm like, dang it. I, I want to like, I don't know. It's just kind of like my style of training is not on par with certain other people's. And it's just like frustrating. Like I'm trying to find a, trying to find my groove in training and it's not the same. Um, leading up to the fight on Saturday, what, what was the best part? Like what, what happened? I saw you, uh, you went to the media, you took a nice photo in front of the media. Um, Izzy saying some very nice things about you as well, which was really, really cool to see. Like for you, what was the best part? I think the best part was, uh, getting recognition from my peers, like the, um, Sean wrote that awesome article and interviewed like Tara LaRosa and like Jeff Osborne and other people who said nice things. And, um, also just being able to thank the media, you know, cause you guys are awesome. And the UFC staff were like clapping for me sometimes uh -huh. and wishing me well. And that was really cool. And like, just, I'm just a non-athletic dorky girl who likes anime, who wants to be, who's a martial artist and just being recognized for all the hard work that I've done that I didn't really expect to get recognition for was really, really cool. So, it, yeah. If you could have like written this script and, and the, your story, at least your active, um, you know, competition story ends in the UFC getting this kind of love and I would have told you, this is how it's going to end. Like 10 years ago, we were, you know, the first time I think I met you was Hoffman Estates, 2009, before the Marlos Kunin fight. Could you have ever imagined that it would have ended like this in the UFC, that everyone's giving you this love and you're legitimately a fan favorite in front of like 16, 17,000 people. Did this exceed your expectations? Way exceeded my expectations. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't have imagined it. Like someone posted a picture of me after my very first fight in Japan. And then me now, I was like, man, like if that me could only see a glimpse of now, like, gosh, like you're actually in the UFC, you accomplished your dream and like people love you. Like, it's so cool. Holy crap. What, Unbelievable. What, what was the goal of that young woman who just got into it into Japan? Like, what, what did you think the ceiling was for you? Just to fight in the octagon. That was it. That was it. Just make it to the UFC. Just to, just to fight. Yeah. Okay. Not get, not have this whole thing, not have a title fight, not become a, just to, just to make it once. Yes. So this was all gravy the last few years. <laughs> Absolutely. Were you ever close to quitting at any point prior to this? Yes. Yes. When? That was, I was close to quitting after I lost season uh, against Raquel Pennington oh. uh, after the season 18 of the ultimate fighter. And then I trained at syndicate for like three months. I found coach John and I feel like I, I felt like I had improved and then I got signed to fight Tara LaRosa and I was on like a five fight losing streak then. Mm -hmm. And I told myself, you, you quit your job, you move back to the States, you focused on fighting full time for like months. If you can't, if you still can't win this fight, Roxanne Montefiore, you better figure out something to do because you got to make money. You got to like, you know, you're in your mid thirties, like figure it out. So, um, or early thirties, um, so if I hadn't won against Tara, I probably would have retired then. Wow. But I did win. That is amazing. That's a lot of pressure on someone going into a fight. Were you super nervous? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I was. What would you have done had you lost that fight? Oh, gosh. Who 
goes try to apply for jobs, I guess. I don't know. Right. Wow. Um, right. That, resume. That article that you referenced that Sean wrote for MA Fighting with all those people saying all those nice things about you, did you know that was coming out? No, I didn't. Oh, my God. So what is it like waking up? You you tweeted. Oh. You retweeted it. I was yeah. like, what? Well, Arrow tweeted this thing and linked me. So then I found it. And so what is going through your mind? This is early morning in Houston when when I did that, at least. I don't know. I think you saw it shortly thereafter. Uh, last Tuesday, I think. What, what do you like? What is happening to you as you're reading? It's very, it's very odd. I would imagine, in a great way, to have like all these people that you probably respect and love and admire just saying all these beautiful, you know, things about you, these wonderful things about you. So, what is going on as you're reading this? I just feel very fulfilled and very honored, and just giving myself some credit because I'm so hard on myself, you know. So it's like finally, this is when I can give myself some credit. Only now, Fine. after 19 years, 50 fights, you can only give yourself credit now. You weren't able to do so earlier. I do. You know, I, I do. But I always feel like I'm running a race. You know, I believe in MMA. We have to run the race. You know, you can never be stagnant. You always have to improve. You know, you're always struggling to get rise in the rankings, be number one, fight the title fight. And now it's finally like you don't have to run the race anymore. It's OK. So I feel like a sense of relief where I'm allowed to look back and say, I did a good job. You know? Oh, okay. Does it feel like a weight has been lifted off your shoulders? Huge. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. It, I, I would imagine that feels good despite the emotions of it coming to an end. That must feel really great. Yes. Especially because I felt like I performed very well. Like it really sucked that I lost, but my previous losses against like Viviani and Tyla, those were worse because I felt like I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Like I was very frustrated in the fight. Um, but for this one, like, oh, Errol, I hit her so much. Like, yeah. I mean, more, she hit me back, of course. Um, but it was just a great brawl and it was just a fun fight and very memorable. And I was proud of myself. What do you think of, uh, young Casey O'Neill? She got booed pretty loudly there and, uh, cut a, uh, an ally Quinta promo on the microphone. What, what do you think of her overall as a, as a fighter and as a person now that you've shared the octagon with her? I'm still trying to figure her out. Um, she didn't, you know, touch gloves with me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but after the fight, she said it was an honor and she bowed down. I was surprised she did that. And she was very respectful for me to me. She, uh, she said hi to me on the airplane was very friendly. Um, but then she cussed out and flipped out the crowd. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna, you know, uh, if she's trying to be a heel, I don't want to like, not, I don't want to ruin her image, but yes. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure her out, but you know, I think, I, I like her. I think uh, she's going to go far. Did it bum you out that she didn't touch gloves? Uh, I didn't have too much time to think about it, but it was just like, oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I was, mean, I totally forgot to step on the scale and I strode straight toward her at the weigh-in. So I, I kind of showed aggression as well. So I, I didn't mind too much. <laughs> that is true. That is true. You were on the same flight together to Houston? Uh, no, we were on the same flight going home. Oh, like yesterday? Yeah, like she was like right across from me. Oh my God. What was that like? Uh, I sat there staring, wondering how she got her hair to stick up in a, in a bun for so long. Wow. Did you say anything <laughs> to each other? Yeah, she said hi to me. And that was it? Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Um, and, and so, all right. So you, uh, you, I remember talking to you at the very beginning of this training camp you know, once the fight got announced and you made the announcement. And I'm just curious about, I, I do this sort of thing where it's like, oh, this is my last time doing this. Like if I know a chapter is ending in my life, right? Were you that way in the buildup to leaving for Houston? Like this is my last time doing the last sparring, last this. And if so, how did, how were you throughout this training camp? Were you a ball of emotions? Were you just kind of focused and didn't let it, you know, how would you describe the way you handled all these final moments leading up to the fight? Mm -hmm. Good question. The way I handled it was, I wanted to make sure I wouldn't regret anything about my choices or my actions. So I wanted to make sure if I had to make hard decisions, I'll make them, but I just didn't want to regret anything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so at the end of the day, I'm very pleased with my decisions. And yes, I was, you know, allowing myself to feel the emotions of it. Like, oh, this is my last week. Like, this is my last sparring session. And I tried hundred percent effort. And then it was over. And I was like, yes, I did it. It's done. I don't have to worry about getting punched in the head again. Uh, unless I decide to train with, you know, my friends Yeah, pretty much. That'll be the only time, like if I need to help them with their fight camps or whatever. Um, but I don't have to stress about martial arts as my job and income. Like I'm right. excited to just, but anyway, to go back to your question. Yes. I was 
allowing myself to enjoy each moment and tell myself, yeah, it's my last one, do your best and then celebrate it when I finished. Um, did other, I'm curious, I, I feel like this happened, but um, did other fighters come up to you throughout the week and say anything to you and um, any of those interactions stick out? Uh, yes, actually Jordan Levitt, the monkey King, uh-huh. he was a, he turned into a big part of my camp, like oh. near the latter, the later half. Um, he helped me spar. We did some private sparring sessions with him and a couple other people. Um, he gave me different looks. Like he's always, he, we've been teammates for like eight or nine years and he's always bigger than me, but we do jujitsu together. But anyway, um, after the fight, he had said that I was the reason he came to syndicate because he saw me fight on the ultimate fighter and then came to syndicate Wow! and, um, he looked up to me as like someone who wasn't afraid to be themselves. Cause he's also kind of like nerdy and, you know, uh, awkward sometimes. Uh-huh. Um, so I was like, wow, cool. Like I hadn't known that he came because of me and, um, and I was like an inspiration and like people sometimes call him the male Roxy or something yeah. in the UFC. So that was really cool that I had that effect on him. So that was something that I remember. That's amazing. Um, and then what about like other fighters who were fighting on the card? Did people come up to you all week in the hotel and stuff like that? 271 card fighters. Um, a couple did. A couple, yeah, said, you know, good luck and happy retirement. And um, I, I got to, at the weigh-ins, I got to thank Izzy for saying those nice things about me. So oh, that wow. Was cool. What was that like? Um, we actually were in the same locker room twice in the past before he became like a superstar. Um, so we had met, but then, yeah, I got to say like, Hey, thanks for saying the nice things. And he was like, Oh, no problem. Good luck. And it was just a nice interaction. Did you see Dana White's comments about you after the, uh, the fight at his press conference? He said that this, Oh, I didn't. What did he say? Uh, he said essentially that, you know, that they love you and that, uh, this will always be your house, that the UFC will always be your house. Oh, that's so nice. Okay. <laughs> Did he say anything to you <laughs> privately after the fight? Uh, I didn't run into him after the fight. He okay. said, you know, shook my hand and said good luck before the fight, of course. Okay. Um, and so now this, now that this chapter is over, you're going to be teaching jujitsu, right? You're still going to be in combat sports. I know your fiance competes as well. Um, do you have any goals, aspirations completely outside of the combat world that you're going to tackle or want to tackle? Um, let's see. I haven't quite finalized or figured that out yet. So, but you know, you I do like... want to do jujitsu, teach jujitsu. I want to finish my third book. I'm like almost done. Um, so hope, hope, eh, hopefully I will publish that, you know, this year sometime. What is it about? It's um, a sequel to my memoirs book. So memoirs of a happy warrior Two. Wow. Wait, so this is your third book. What was your, what, what was this the, my th- what was the first book? The first book was Memoirs of a Happy Warrior, one yeah. about my life uh, as an exchange student. The second one was How to Be Positive. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. The third yes. one will be another Memoirs. Okay, yeah. I love, and this covers, I would imagine, like the whole UFC run, right? Yes, it'll cover from my graduation uh, from college to like now. Oh my gosh, okay. So from Japan to UFC to Invicta and all that. Uh, the Ultimate Fighter Diaries I'm putting in there because I journaled extensively. Oh, really? Wow. Which yeah. one? The first one or the second one? Both of them. Oh my gosh. I, speaking of <laughs> diaries, I actually on Saturday was looking at your MySpace page because the real OG fans what? will know what the, My, you know, the MySpace page was legendary back in the day. I couldn't find the link. Do you still have access to it? I mean, I, all I had to do was type it in and I think it's myspace.com slash Roxy fighter, but here's the problem, Roxy. And I guess this is not going to make you very excited. I couldn't find the blog. Oh, but it's up here. Was it's, it blank? It says, uh, if you go to myspace.com slash roxyfighter, there's the picture of you wearing the MMA.tv shirt, right? And what? It, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'll and like I, later. I got I to gotta figure this out. I, I was like reminiscing about it because that's how I was introduced to you via your MySpace page right. back in the day. It says, uh, Kanto Japan. I can't read the, the first. What's the first? Uh, Kita Namorukian? Kanto Japan? Is that the town? that you lived in? Uh, probably. Yeah. Okay. That's where it says your location is. Um, oh, and, uh, man. yeah, but I was, and I wanted to find the blogs, but the blogs aren't here. Do you, ha- do you, did you uh, save them or no? No, I didn't. Uh, I, 
I think I have like a private journal with that information, but I think I wrote the blogs like for the public more. Right. So the information's there. But I don't have the blog, but yeah, I yeah. I will go look for it because one of my fans was the one who gave me my nickname, and I wanted to go thank them. Like I have no idea who they are. That's amazing. Gave me my nickname. When was that? Uh, I was in so sometime. 2005, you know, six, seven, eight, nine. Right. And a fa- just a fan just sent it to you like via met, like how did they give you this nickname? Oh, I ranted on my blog about these unpleasant things that happened to me. And then I was like, but at least this happened and this happened. And right. I said some positive thing. And the, the fan goes, Oh, you are the happy warrior. Wow. I said, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping just for nostalgia purposes that you would come out with this bad boy just for fun for the old school fans. Oh. Was there any thoughts of it? I didn't, I didn't think no. about it. Do you still have these? I have a couple. A couple. You signed this one for me. Uh-huh. Let, I, I will never, uh, I will never let go of this. Um, and so you will though, do, you will be in, 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 uh, the world of combat, jujitsu, all this stuff, but there is, I feel like there's a part of you that would like to do something completely outside. You just don't quite know what it is, but you would like to spread your wings a little bit. Is that fair to say? Maybe. I don't know. Okay. All right, we'll keep we're keeping it uh, close to our vests on this one. I appreciate it. <laughs> and when you look back, like when you're when you're older and uh, you're thinking back on your career, if someone wanted to watch the quintessential Roxy fight, your favorite fight of all time, which is it? Oh my gosh, what do you think, Ariel? I want your opinion. Oh my, I mean, you want me to pick what my favorite Roxy fight is, or what I think your yes. favorite fight is? What your top two favorites? Well, to me, like the Macy Barber fight is very, very special because I felt like A, it was a big card. It was the Connor fight, right? And I felt like they were, you know, they were trying to build up Macy off your back. And you were like, not today. I'm not done. You're not going to use me as a stepping stone. She's young. I've been around the block. I'm here. I'm a veteran. I still got some fight left. So I hate to pick a UFC one just because I want to be more of like a hipster and pick like an old school fight. But I, I think I'd have yeah. to pick the... Uh, the the and I I'll get your take when I'm when I'm done this and then I want to go old school. Let me see, let me see. Um, man, that's tough. I remember I remember that Moosin card with you and Tyler Rosa. That was crazy. Marius yeah. Pujanowski fought on that one. You remember that? Um, oh yeah. The the huge uh, you know strongman <laughs> yeah, guy. Right. That was crazy. Um, first Marlos Kunin fight was big time. That was big time. Um, the Andrea Lee win in Invicta was a big time one. Um, I'll, I'll go with uh, the Barb Honchak one was great too. I'll go with I'll go with the first Marlos Kuhn one because I thought that was huge and uh, and the Macy Barber fight. Okay, cool. What do you say? Yeah, but, all my UFC fights were scraps everywhere. So, but but I I don't have like an emotional investment like you do to these fights because you don't know where you were in your life and what was going. And I don't right. know, excuse me, where you were in your life. So when you say like your quintess, your favorite fight, if someone wanted to go back and watch the Happy Warrior fight, the Roxanne Modafferi fight, which is it? Probably um, Nico's the fight with Nico, my title fight. Really? And and then oh, you know what? I was just thinking. I was thinking this on the drive um, to do chores today. Um, one of the fights that inspired me to really start go and do MMA was Robbie Lawler and Aaron Riley. Really? Remember that fight? Of it was course. UFC 35 and like Aaron Riley just kept coming forward and Robbie Lawler kept tagging him and they just had like a brawl. And I was like, I told myself like, Roxy, you're thinking about MMA. Are you willing to do that fight? Are you willing to get busted up and be- bleed and like whatever, like, will you do that fight? And I looked at that fight and I was inspired by Aaron Riley. And I was like, he's getting beat up, but he never stopped going forward. And, uh, I think I might've had that fight. Wow. Yes. You know? That like, is amazing. I kept going forward. I kept trying to like, so it made me feel kind of good when I thought of it this morning, like this last fight, I think was one of my best performances, you know, like a lot of people online were still dissing my striking ability. Like, okay, I'm not Yuan Jen Jay Um, it's fine. But for me, that was really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, I had improved and I'm able to say like, hey, I worked hard and I improved. So probably this last fight with Casey, I felt sharp. And then uh, my Nico fight, I just kept going forward and I just wanted to win and, and do my best. 
So, so first of all, the way you speak of that Aaron Riley fight and how you say like, oh, this last fight was that fight, that's your career. It's not just the fight. Like you just kept going forward. It's really symbolic of your career. However, Roxy, and this is also symbolic of you, you pick two losses. You can't pick two losses. Why would you pick two <laughs> losses? You pick two fights that you lost as your favorite fights. That oh, makes no God. sense. You got to give well, us a victory. Was, you know, <laughs> okay. Barb Honchak. Barb Honchak? Why? Yeah. Um, because I overcame this loss that I had seven years ago and I did really well and I took her down and I managed to finish the fight. Okay. That is a good, uh, that is a good reason. Um, in conclusion, what, what, what do you, you know, maybe something that you didn't have a chance to say, is there anything you want to say to the fans, to all the people who, um, have supported you for all these years and have been watching you and had your back, uh, through the good times, through the bad times, anything you'd like to say to those people? Yeah, you guys are like my friends. Like, don't stop watching me. I'm still going to go on adventures. I'm still going to post on social media. You know, I'm still going to entertain you guys. You know, we're, we're together. Like, I'm I'm your your uh, your fighter girl. Yeah. Roxy fighter. I'm your fighter girl. So don't stop watching. It's only it's only, uh, you know, uh, crossroads. We're still going. I love it. And I'm happy to hear that. And I want to congratulate you on an incredible career, Roxy. It's really been amazing. I'll never forget the first time I met you in uh, Hoffman Estates, uh, outside of Chicago. And uh, you you knew who I was and that blew my mind. I was like, I you at that point you had been fighting, you know, for almost a decade. I was like, you know who I am? That blew my mind. You were so nice. You were always so nice to me. You gave me the book, you gave me this um, gift for the studio. And uh, I brought it with me to every stop, ESPN back and all that stuff. You've, uh, you've really been a great friend and a great person to cover. So congratulations on always being you and doing it your way and never quitting and never letting people tell you that you're not good enough and that you, you, you don't belong and that you're not athletic enough. Like you did it your way. And not a lot of people could say that win or lose. Doesn't matter what your record is. The fact that you did your way for almost 20 years and made it to the pinnacle of this sport, you have nothing to be ashamed of. So congratulations on an incredible career. And it was a real joy to watch you fight. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you, Ariel. All right. I will talk to you soon. All the best to you. And again, thank you for coming on as always. And congrats on a great fight on Saturday. It was a really fun fight to watch. It was quintessential Roxy, if I uh, could say so myself. So I appreciate it. Enjoy it and enjoy retirement. Thank you so much. All right. There she is. Roxanne Modafferi, the legend, the last of the OGs. That was a great, uh, a great tweet from uh, Shayna Baszler, who's now doing big things, of course, in the world of professional wrestling, uh, she wrote something on Saturday. I think I have it somewhere. Yeah, she wrote, feeling nostalgic tonight. The last of a forgotten generation of women's MMA fighters. Lucky to have shared a ring and a friendship with Roxy into the sunset Roxy fighter. And it's true. There was a period where, you know, you see women's MMA now and you see people like... Uh, you know, Ronda Rousey before and Gina Carano before and now Valentina Shevchenko and Amanda Nunes and Juliana Pena and uh, Casey O'Neill and all these great fighters. And you think that this was just always a part of the show. This was always a part of the sport. This was always a part of the events. It wasn't. You forget that not that long ago, I mean, not only were there no women in the UFC, there were no, you know, it was just the odd Elite XC women's fight. There was the odd Strike Force women's fight. There was hook and shoot back in the day um, with Jeff Osborne, who's referenced in that great article. And if you haven't read that article, and it's not, it's not an article. It's a, uh, what can I put? It's like a feature. It's, 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 it's a quintessential Shaheen Al Shadi feature where he talks to all these people who are a big part of not only um, Roxy's life, but the sport of MMA, women's MMA, about what she meant to the sport. And uh, it's just amazing. It, it can really capture... Um, if you, if you're unfamiliar with her, if you haven't been watching, if you weren't following, if you're newer to the sport, like it can really give you a sense of why this person is so special. She doesn't look like your typical fighter. She doesn't fight like your typical fighter, but she was, uh, she was like one of those, those fun parts of the sport that made us all love it so much. So I, I'm sad to see her go and, um, I'm happy that she's going with her head held high and that she has no regrets and is happy to move on and has a weight lift. Whenever you hear someone say they have a weight lifted off their shoulders, that's nice to hear. So um, she didn't win that UFC title, but who cares? She got the fight, fight for it. And, and honestly, I don't think anyone would have predicted that, that she would have fought for a UFC belt early in her career. 
And someone needs to do a documentary on those early days of women's MMA when they were just kind of like this forgotten part of the sport. Because remember, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, Ultimate Fighter, you know, the sport is growing, but it's it's just growing on the male side of things in terms of notoriety and in terms of acceptance and uh, attention. And it's just, you know, it's really, you know, the, the, the Gina fight against Julie Kedzie and then the Cyborg fight. Um, and then, of course, Ronda comes along. It's only then that the sport starts to accept the women at an equal level to the men. Um, and they still don't get paid as much as the men. And they should get paid as much as the men. Um, but I, I am proud of this as far as MMA is concerned. I love the fact that you can have a card, an MMA card, with 11 male fights and then the main event two females and no one bats an eye. No one says it's a lesser fight. No one says it's a lesser, you know, main event. No one, you know, it feels to me, at least the way the majority of the fans that I interact with, it feels to me like women are viewed at the same level as equals as the men. And I don't think you can say that about every other sport. Definitely not boxing. I mean, look at the big deal that we're making about Serrano, Katie Taylor, and rightfully so. But look at the fact that like this is supremely rare for boxing, that two women are headlining their own show and they're getting all this attention, attention they deserve. Now, they're getting paid way more than the majority of the female fighters in MMA are getting paid, and that's huge for them, and you'd like to see that crossover. But in terms of attention and acceptance, uh, boxing was late to the game. You you have a double header on uh, ABC, and it's, you know, Lakers Warriors followed by the Las Vegas Aces and the New York Liberty uh, people aren't sticking around. That's just that you know. That's just facts. Now there are other sports leagues, like I'd say tennis, and maybe golf to a degree, where I feel like people are viewing the women the same. But this sport, which you know sometimes gets a bad rap as being you know a bunch of Neanderthals and alpha males and you know cavemen, I feel like the 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 majority of MMA fans in the MMA community respect women and treat them as equals and have always supported the women's fighters. Now it's a lot more popular. And so, you know, if you if you used to go on the UG back in the day or Sure Dog and all that stuff, like the women were never treated as second class citizens, the women fighters at least. Um and I'm 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 proud of that. I I I'm proud. It, it is a very open minded and and progressive uh community for the most part. I know you can pin but like when it comes to this particular issue I, I feel, and I think most of the female fighters would agree, regardless of where they've fought, you know, people don't treat it as a bathroom break. They don't get booed. They don't get disrespected by the fans. It is really cool that you can have 11 fights with males and in the main event have two females and no one thinks it's a lesser product. So I don't think that gets said enough about MMA. And I think that uh, the community deserves a lot of credit for that. All right. Uh, later in the program, going to be joined by uh, Booker T., you may recall Booker T and I were entangled in quite the rivalry back in the day. I mean, it went on and on and on, and it was in large part because of one man, that man. I mean, I came to his defense when Booker T came after him, and he tried to check him, and I came to his defense. But I do... I, there's a few things that are going to be discussed. Now, the reason why Booker T is on today, I'm talking about Booker T, the five-time, 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 five-time WCW champion, um, also legend, still a part of the WWE broadcast, uh, radio host as well. He's coming on because he was a part of the media on Saturday. He was at the post-fight press conference answering, excuse me, asking all types of questions, good questions too. To Izzy. Izzy's reaction was great to Dana, to other people as well. And so I thought, wow, this would be a good opportunity to have um, Booker T on the program. And so I'm looking forward to that. Also, we'll be joined by Johnny Walker, Rick's Picks as well. In a second, we're going to check in with uh, GC, who's back from Phoenix. He went to Phoenix to attend some kind of uh, golf tournament. But first... Oh, yeah, I like this. Hoops fans... As you know, the latest offer from DraftKings Sportsbook, unofficial sports betting partner of the NBA, I'm glad we've transitioned over now to the NBA, is too good to pass up. New customers, listen to this, can bet just $1 on any team and get $150 in free bets if they win. It's that simple. 
If Sportsbook isn't available in your state just yet, you can still take your shot at a big payday. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Contests. DraftKings is giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code DMAR. Bet just $1 on any NBA team. Don't bet on the Knicks. They suck. And get $150 in free bets if they win. That's promo code DMAR at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. 21 and older. Minimum, 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 minimum. I'm rewinding the tape. I'm going to have to do this again, probably. 21 and older. Minimum age and location requirements vary by jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for a full list of requirements and state-specific responsible gaming resources. Void where prohibited. Minimum $5 deposit. Gambling prompt call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Tennessee, call or text the Tennessee red line 1-800-889-9789. In Connecticut, call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE NY or tax hope and why four six seven three six nine yeah oh yeah here he is oh my god <laughs> i mean how about this wow this better is better than i thought it was gonna be wow we could rent this out for people's valentine's day dates i mean this is like this is a love booth yeah yeah, I mean, it, from the side, too, when you're not getting everything cut off by the cameras, it, it looks wow. like it's, it's pretty good. I feel like we're in, you know, like one of the... Have you been to Japan? No. Nah. They've got these really cool themed cafes in Japan. I've been to a cat cafe in Japan, uh-huh. Western KC, so there's just a, a cafe with a bunch of cats everywhere. This feels like a very sort of love Japanese type of vibe. I love it. I feel like you need some Hello Kitty up there and you're good to go. This is amazing. I mean, this, now I'm curious, are we using the same um, lights as we did for the Christmas or is it? No, no. Different lights. Those were were colored for Christmas. These are Valentine's lights. uh, Wow. Red, pink, white. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) I got the hearts, you know. Wow. I love it. Well done. We have to spruce it up because the posters this week are Are a little clumsy. They're lacking. Well, you know, we do have to say that the original poster was supposed to be... Yeah, it was much better. Much better. Yeah, Rafael. Bellator, is again, just, just not doing much. Mailing it not in. Doing, mailing it in yeah, is... Yeah. It's an understatement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, this is nice. What is the thing in back of your head over there next to the certificate? Oh, you, you don't recognize this? I don't... Well, there's a heart. Oh. PFL Challenger Series? Stop. We got that on Friday, man. Come it's on. Like, <laughs> You didn't know that was coming up on Friday? Uh, I guess. February 18th. Yeah, that's right. Week one, baby. Light heavyweights going at it. This guy, I mean, literally a year ago, you probably never heard of PFL. (laughs) I mean, let's be honest. No no comment. And now I see you in the back, or I hear you in the back, like, I don't know what you guys were debating. Takedowns. Were you talking about Derek Lewis, Tai Tuivasa? What were you talking about? Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Joe Joe almost cashed the ticket on Derek Lewis. I know. He told me. Poor guy. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, how was Arizona? Yeah, it was amazing. It was a lot. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need a couple of days to recover from it. I gotta say, I, I still, I can't believe this is such a big thing, and I can't believe I never heard of it until yeah. you told me. Yeah, I wish we could use the video on here. I wish we could show the people how insane you can. Uh, that hole was. Nah, I mean it was CBS. Oh, I thought maybe you took it yourself. Oh no, no, no! Phone was kaput by the time. Uh, really? Yeah. I guess I could have done a different one. We, you know, like the first golfer came through. We had been waiting there for like five hours. So, like, what are you doing to pass the time? <laughs> Chilling. <laughs> Just ch- how many know. people? Uh, the stadium itself holds twenty thousand people around the hole. Come on, really? Yeah, yeah, dude. 20, it, I'm like, I was shocked that it's like it's like a football game, and like normally you always have to be quiet before the golfer hits. Like it's like encouraged that you like scream and heckle the golfer like while they swing and everything. Have you ever been? No, this is my first time at this one. And I've been to a bunch of go? golf tournaments. It's just like a bucket list item. It's right. like it's like known as like being the craziest hole in golf. So was it worth it? Yes. Yeah, I got up at four thirty. He like stand outside the gates. I mean, there were thousands of people outside the gate before it started, and then like they just like release you, like just like I don't even, I don't even know how to describe. It. Like just horses running through. It was, it was crazy. Is it first come first serve? Yeah, first come, first serve. Wow. And you have to like you have to sprint to the hole and like it's way longer than people realize. So a bunch of people are like gassing out and uh, dying. Good it's thing like you're a, a yeah, marathon. Like a solid half month. Oh yeah. I made it easy, you know. Made and is there a concession or do you have to bring your own food? I wish you could bring your own food, not concessions, expensive concessions. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. 
I had a hot dog for breakfast at like 7.30 in the God. morning. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're on New York time. So what is that? Two hours back? Yeah, at 9.30, you know? Yeah. Um, and that one dude hit a hole in one. Oh, it was insane. Insanity. And by the way, I'm bearing the lead. You went to LFA on Friday. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't get to that first. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, it was just a coincidence of all coincidences. I pick up, uh, you know, your other producer, TST, at his yeah. hotel. And he's like, yeah, there was a bunch of fighters walking around in here. And I didn't know what it was. And then I find out that uh, LFA is happening in Phoenix on Friday night. And I was wow. like, okay, well, we're going to have to go to that. <laughs> I don't care how early we have to get up on Saturday. We are going to be attending uh, LFA. So, uh, yeah, we went to LFA 124, the Arizona Federal Theater. Um, I actually got some pictures. It was it was a great show. Like, it was... Yeah? Uh, how many people? Oh, man, I don't know. 1,500. Okay. Uh, you know, For Miga in the main event? Yeah, man. Uh, has a win over Davison Figueredo. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it was pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, if we can go to the pictures here from from the evening. I mean, you can take uh, you take a picture. So here's where I sat. We'll we'll, we'll start with that. You know, I, I did the whole okay. thing. Nice. Great great view. You know, nice and centered up. Uh, got a picture. You know, drinking a, a drink brewed for those with a fighting spirit here. In you front did. Of the, uh, yeah, oh there wow! We go. And look at this. I got the fist up, looking all intimidating. Man. And then I get a picture with the belt, you know, they offered, you know, look at that. Wait, what I is mean, this, like a this. super fan thing that you did? Or can anyone take this picture? <laughs> Anybody pay for take VIP the take? No, no, I mean, they, they had the belt on a platter asking you to come. I mean, look at that. Look anyone that. recognize you? <laughs> no. Christian Erickson? No. Uh, yeah, that's that would be more likely than What someone. shirt are you wearing? I can't see champions. Uh, Tostitos Fiesta Bowl, oh. 1998. Yeah. Okay. It's a nice homage to Arizona. Since oh, Arizona. right, right, right. Wow. Look at that shot. Okay. What else we got? Uh, that's it. Those are all okay. That's it. All right. Yeah. Did you stay for the whole card? Whole card, dude. And I actually was impressed with the pacing of it, man. They were moving fight after fight. They, How they long moved did it, it take? quickly. I mean, the main card probably took like an hour and fifteen minutes. Oh wow! How I many mean, fights like we were, total? Uh, five, five or six. Oh, that was it. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of like, so there was a lot of really early stoppages, but then you know, three minutes they were walking the next fighters out. Wow. Yeah, the pacing was really nice. And for did it. you go for the first fight? No, nah, not like the prelims. Oh, first fight I saw was Anho in the main card. He won with like a spinning back fist. Wow. Yeah, and so we kept it rolling from there. Uh, Wait, is that I, your I first know. MMA event? First MMA event. Oh my God. Your first MMA event was LFA what? What was it? 124. Wow. That was crazy, man. An event that will live in infamy. Yeah, it was, I mean, I was betting on these guys and, and like I was in the crowd with their families. Really? So like, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, there was one dude, Ahmad uh, Hassanzada. It's a, a fighter from Afghanistan. I bet on him as an underdog and I am almost positive his girl, the girlfriend of the guy he was facing, James Wilson, was sitting right behind me. Oh, no. She was just like, she was going all out for this James oh, guy. Man. Yeah. So it was pretty sad because yeah. he lost. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Well done. So you did that. Yeah, you went to the time. golf on uh, Saturday, and golf then you Saturday. watched uh, UFC. I would presume you watched two seventy one, yeah. and you're wearing the t shirt. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is he and still? Yep. Yeah, yeah we watched UFC two seventy one. It was fantastic. Did I you mean, go somewhere for it, or uh, nah? Just stayed at the Airbnb. Yeah. Nice big TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then made it in time for the Super Bowl. Made it in time for the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, what yeah. A I mean, it was a jam packed weekend. Um, so how did we do two seventy one? We did good, man. Yeah, yeah, we did good. Uh, we'll we'll skip over the LFA results, you know. We we, we got like a a quick little quarter units. We'll start with the uh, UFC. We'll go to the okay. big show. We I mean, said we need. This is your time to shine. You do whatever. Well, we you said want. we needed a big weekend. Yeah. We said we needed a big weekend, and that's exactly what we got. Uh, we'll start with the singles here. We uh, you know sweep these up. C Carlos Alberg. I know. I know New York Drake is upset that I that I cashed the Alberg ticket. I know. Um, he's very anti Alberg for some weird I, reason. I know. I know. He's he's a hater, but you know he got it done. Jared Cannonier gets it done as well. Uh, so yeah, nice, a nice little start with the singles. And then, uh, we move on to the parlays, clean sweep of the parlays. Uh, you know, we clean up good except for the air fryer. We hit the three big ones. Uh, and then we come one short of the air fryer, just like Joe. If Derek Lewis had got the knockout in that exchange, Damn. I would have had a perfect night. Wow. Yep. Derek Lewis get, getting the KO away from having a perfect night. Yeah. I mean, look, I think most people thought Derek was going to win that fight. That's yeah. the one. I mean, unbelievable Hard knockout. Crazy. Unbelievable knockout by Ty. Um, so, yeah, that brings us to the final recap. We finish up 6.73 units. I think that might be the biggest weekend we've had so far, which uh, brings us up 4.2 units in 2022 and up over 16 units wow. since we started doing this. Yeah. Back on track, man. What did you think of Izzy? That's your guy. I thought it was great, man. Well, a lot of people. Was... Well, for, did you score it for him? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I got I got a little bit worried with like a recency bias at like nearing the end of the fight, but then like if you I rewatched it, and I mean like it, 
you had to be worried, like, if if you were cheering for Whitaker, that he was going to get finished. Like, mm-hmm. like I, I was worried about the over one and a half cashing for a second there that Izzy might just finish him. I mean, he came out dominating. Um, and then, yeah, it, it started to get closer as the fight went on, but we talked about it, like, Whitaker with the takedowns, when he got his back, he really wasn't doing anything with it. I mean, Eugene right. Behrman said it as well. Like, I just don't think he did anything to warrant, like, you know, big points coming for him from the judges. So, yeah, I, I think Izzy got it done. The main thing that, excuse me, that actually concerned me, not not that I was rooting for one guy over the other, but, you know, it's Texas. So you can never really... There were some yeah. funky ones, right? There were some funky... I mean, yeah, not to go against Roxanne. I know she was know, just on the I show. Know. The split decision, <laughs> I like... I was sitting there because I had Casey O'Neill and I was like, oh my God, like, are they actually going to give this to Roxanne yeah. for a second? And uh, That was weird. That was weird. I wish, you know, the reason I didn't even bring it up because like who cares? Ultimately, yeah. she didn't win the fight and I think any sane person thinks that she didn't win the fight. I wish they didn't focus on that. I get why you focus on that on the broadcast, but as she was walking out, you know, like right. we just like pause the judging commentary for a second and just sort of appreciate this moment but yes i mean there's there's a bigger issue there because another guy scores a feroxy and all of a sudden the wrong person wins exactly um, you don't yeah. want that so that i mean texas is just a weird place the weirdest part about texas is like a lot of people just don't have a lot of experience there and they give them these opportunities to be on you know these big cards the weird one about the main event was mike beltran who's i know he's a ref and judge but historically is more of a ref than a judge he was a judge for the main event and I didn't really agree with his scorecard either. But again, in the end, the right person won. So yeah, you're yeah. sort of playing with That's, fire. But I yes. thought Izzy was fine. I mean, I don't know. Was it what, like, is it the first, is it the first fight that you're going to put on, you know, your phone or computer or TV to show someone why you love Izzy? No, but Whitaker's really good and he's really tough. Yeah. Well, he's amazing. Like yeah. he's beyond with Izzy. He's what, 11 and 0 as a middleweight? Yeah. Like the only person he loses to is that Asanya? I mean, I agree with you. It wasn't like the most insane, like compelling fight, but I mean, it was two just super high level guys going at it. I, I mean, I enjoyed it. It's an interesting thing because Izzy now is 22 and one. I wonder if he was 23 and 0 and never moved up, if people would be making a bigger, because now you'd be like, oh, he's a few away from, you know, challenging Khabib's record, undefeated. Yeah. That one, you know, and again, yeah, one blemish, man. People love the O. They, they 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 don't regret it, and he dared to be great, but I wonder how people would view him if he was on this Monday 23-0 as opposed to 22-1. and one. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, imagine if he had won the Yawn fight. Imagine oh, or that. Had, yeah, or double that. champ, 23-0. Right. and 0. I mean, oh, then you oh start talking about, like, you know, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. he starts getting thrown in the GOAT conversation and everything. Yeah, people are um, debating, like, who's the biggest draw in the UFC now as far as the champions are concerned. And I don't, I mean... Here's the thing. Usman, I think his pay-per-view... So the champions are Davis and Figueredo, Aljamain Sterling, Alex Volkanovsky, Charles Oliveira, Usman, Adesonia, Glover Teixeira, and Francis. It's not... Histo- you know, let's just call it like it is. The UFC has had a bigger crop of draws as far as champions in the past, like more fighters who were draws champions. This is not their strongest lineup in terms of draws who are champions. You know what I mean? Yeah. You had like Jones and Connor and all this stuff. Um, female, well, of course. Connor said something, speaking of McGregor, how Izzy is a performer. Like that, he tweeted something out about that, like one of the last two performers in the UFC. And I kind of agree with that. I like watching Izzy because he is like a performer. Like the, you know, he's always got a cool walkout. He's always doing something mm-hmm. crazy. Like the the rock, paper, scissors to start the fight. Like just like things like that. Like, I mean, I just, I just love watching him fight. I mean, I think I would probably say he's the biggest draw. Oh my god. The the I totally missed the rock, paper, scissors. Oh, he did. How he has the <laughs> yeah. like presence of mind in those Dude. moments to do those things. He always has different things planned, like when he's flipping through the book, writing down what Bruce Buffer's saying, when he does like the arm, like he's cocking the gun and everything. Like he's yeah, he's always got something up his sleeve. Oh my god. Um anyway, uh I was thinking about this over the weekend. So I think if you act if you actually looked at the the numbers that Usman has drawn as of late, or dr- drawn or drawn? I feel like my brain isn't working today. Drawn, right? Drawn? Yes, drawn. Is it drawn or drawn? Drawn. 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 What the f- Anyway, Usman has benefited from the fact that he's had two amazing rivals, right? Amazing rivals who can sell fights. Colby Covington can sell a fight, right? He's had two fights against him. This guy named Jorge Masvidal, he could sell a fight. He's had 
two fights against him as well. He's had four heated fights as a champion, right? And so I think he's benefited from that. Izzy hasn't had that just yet. And that's not a knock on Whitaker, but Whitaker isn't that, you know, like, Masvidal's a big star. Covington brings... So I think Izzy's a bigger worldwide star than Kamaru Usman. I just think that if you look at the numbers, it won't reflect that because historically in this sport, it takes two to tango. You need that second guy, right? Just ask Jose Aldo. Just ask Anderson Silva. Anderson got Chael. Aldo got Conor McGregor. And we could go down the list of other guys over the years. And so this debate over like, is he a draw? Is he not a draw? Is he's a draw? He's, I mean, the top three guys in the sport, arguably as far as champions who are draws right now, are probably uh, Usman, Izzy and Francis. And I would say of those three worldwide, Izzy's the most well-known and liked. He just hasn't had that other guy. He hasn't had that other guy to elevate him. I don't know if Cannoneer is that guy. I don't really know if I... I don't know if Cannoneer is that guy. No, but I I, I, I don't, don't... I don't I don't really know who in the middleweight division. That's the like, problem. I guess Strickland, I was just going to say. Like, Strickland could probably bring, Strickland's like... Strickland's not that guy. You don't think he could bring, like, crazy press conferences and, like, all his fans, like, backing him and everything? Like, the press conferences could get pretty crazy between Can't, Izzy and Strickland. Uh, crazy no. or, like, cringe? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I'm trying, let me see here, the middleweight division. Um, Whitaker, Vittori, Cannon. I mean, Vittori tried, God bless him. Yeah. Costa sort of tried. Yeah. Uh, Strickland. Okay. Now, why don't you say it? Don't, don't, don't be shy. He's sitting, you're sitting right there. Oh, you're thinking about Hamzat? Well, Hamzat, well, Hamzat well, moving up to 185? The dude said it, right to, yeah. your, to your left. Yeah, I mean, he said EJ that. EJ just said it. Oh, oh. He just slacked me. Oh. What'd he, he say? What, he can't use the mic? What'd he say? Uh, Hamza or something? Yeah, he said Hamza. No, he's yeah, like, I mean, uh, is that the guy? I mean, if he moved up to 185, he gets a title shot against Izzy. Yes, it would sell crazy. But he's. But I guess I don't even consider him that because he's not moving yeah. up to 185. Yeah, he's at, he's at 170. He's got he's got things to deal with. At he's got things to deal with. Like it's We're literally a year and a half away. Now, granted, that could be the guy, um, but we're... I mean, I'm talking like right now in, yeah. in this I, I really quest to fight is, three, four or five be Like the partner to like really propel a fight into yeah. like this, like stratosphere. Darren Till. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Darren Till can sell some fights. Um, a lot of people hit big this weekend. Oh yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I tend to go long. And, no, 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 no. Yeah. No, I like it. I like the discussion. I don't really have like, you know, no, no friends that I can have these discussions with. Uh, this was actually like the hardest time I've had choosing a big hitter. I mean, we had some people like that really balled out. Uh, we'll start with the first one, informal cap, five nine eight one on Reddit. I mean, this is just crazy. Six legs plus fifty four thousand two hundred thirty three turns twenty dollars into over ten grand. Holy smokes! Six legs: Arlovsky, Bobby Green, Moicano by sub, Jared Cannonier's second round finish, Tui Vasa by KO, Adesanya by unanimous decision. Wow, twenty dollars into over ten grand. I mean, that's, that's just nuts. I mean, that now is wait, nuts. did this guy send it to you or did he post it on Reddit? Someone sent it to me on okay. Twitter through Reddit. Yeah. So uh, yeah, if Informal Caps watching, shout out to you, man. What yeah. a weekend. Uh, next up, uh, our old man Cody Saftik. <laughs> CJ Saftik. Come on. Wait I mean, a second. Did he send this to you or did you? No, no, no. I, I threw it out there and he sent it to me, man. I got I to gotta respect game, man. Me, me and Cody, water under the bridge, man. I mean, this guy. He, he goes 4,500 on a plus 347, 1,000 on a plus 529. Profits over $20,000. Gets even more on singles. I mean, this guy got a year's worth of rent in, uh, in one fight night. I mean, he just... Any Bellator plays there? <laughs> All right, let's go through some honorable mentions real quick. Uh, Ian Pompre. Uh, shout out to oh, that's my guy. Killing. Yeah, man, he's been I killing it in 2022. He said, uh, he said if he hits an eight leg parlay, I had to give him a shout out, so I gave him a shout out. Uh, he has been doing well. Eight leg, yeah, yeah, Holy eight smokes. leg plus 1200. Wow, yeah, man, I mean, he killed it. He killed it. Ghost face, we see him a lot. Nine leg parlay plus 2100 turns 25 dollars into 550. <laughs> and then the last one, Uncle Richie. So this guy went 13 for 13, had a uh. Plus 218,328 on the line going into the main event. He had Whitaker, so he made the wise choice, and he cashed out, turned $1 into 554. Wow. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty crazy. So, yeah. That's nice. 
Shout out to the big hitters. I mean, people are always cashing crazy tickets. So it's always nice to see people winning. Yeah. Um, and then DraftKings, man. I, I, yeah. you know, I'm just really firing off the shout outs here. We what got we the got? 150. We 150, well. huh? Yeah, we, we did it, man. We got it pretty easily. Uh, and the DraftKing for this week, um, our man Biff8888, eight, 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 eight. Uh, he ends up cashing $200. <laughs> beats, beats 149 people. How do you do it? Unfortunately, he didn't have a picture. He uh, a picture of Khabib. What? Yeah, so there he is. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> Just for you. <laughs> Just for you, we brought it back. I want to see it. I want to see it again. It's like, it's like what is it? Arkanoid? Oh, this is amazing. How do you do that? I mean, this is just... Now, can I ask a question? Can I break people. the fourth wall? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Biff8888. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's my favorite part. That's my favorite part. Beat 149 other people to become the draft king this week. Frank, can I ask you a question? When it hits the bottom of the screen like that, are you playing a sound to time it, or is it? No, that, that was all pre-programmed by Connor. How do you do that? So there's this thing called a computer. It's, just, it's the magic, <laughs> man. It's the magic of production. Uh, and then we did the exact league too. Oh yeah, five yeah. people joined up. Our man, uh, our man K Dog 13K. Uh, he brings home four hundred fifty dollars. Uh, I believe we have a, a picture of him Legit. right here. Look at him. There he is. What? That's you. Me. Yeah, me and him on the boat. Yeah, his, he also doesn't have a picture. It's a picture of his dog. I wish people would get pictures of. Yeah, themselves. come on. Like, come on. We could really make this fun if yeah. you get pictures. So, I, yeah, here's me and him being execs on a boat. He wins four hundred fifty dollars. Wait a second. That's on his picture, right? That's his picture on DraftKings. It's oh, the dog. dog. See, like yeah. for me, that dog is like a black square because my even with the glasses, my eyesight sucks. So uh, okay, I see what yeah. you did. Both of you are sitting there as executives, and you, yeah, okay, boat. that's yeah, amazing. He's popping the champagne because yeah, he won four hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's, that's not bad for fifty. This man, dude, this man's cleaning up. You can see how much people have won throughout the course of the league. This guy's gotten over seven hundred dollars. So shout Good out to K Dog, man. He's killing it. K Dog, respect. And what did he? Well, like, who did he have? Oh man, you know, I should have written that down. Okay, cool. Should have cool. taken the time. <laughs> <laughs> to write oh. that down. So how many people made it to that? 25? Yeah, 25. We might go bigger on the exec league, man. It filled up fast and people were asking for open spots. But you know. What do you think? Uh, 50 for I Masvidal? Think we could do 50. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's go 50 for Masvidal. And we'll, we'll go full 200. 200? Yeah. yeah, we'll go big for March 5th. Is that bad when I do that audio-wise? <laughs> nah, man. It's music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. Well, I'm excited. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't, you, you know, we're kind of new to each other's lives, but this next interview could go sideways. I just want to let you know. I'm looking forward to it. I'm still not sure if Booker likes me or not. Booker T. Huffman? Yes, yeah, Booker T. Huffman, uh, the five-time WCW champion. Basically, the backstory is um, early days of DC and Hawani. DC, when he retired, right after he retired, he said he wanted to do some wrestling. Booker T. has a show called the Hall of Fame. I need to pull up uh, where that uh, – it's on uh, ESPN Radio in Houston. and um, Shout out to ESPN Radio Houston. Yeah, 97.5. Oh, yeah. Great station. Uh, you know it? <laughs> I mean, I know all okay. the affiliates. I mean, you do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, anyway, he said, like, hey, man, you want to go to Roman Reigns? You want to go to WrestleMania? Like, you got to go through me. And so I was like, yo, man, you ain't talking about my guy, and I'm just going to sit here off to the side – and let you, you know, step to him. So you're going to have to go through me. And then it got into a whole thing where at one point I was on the McAfee show and he called in and then I called DC on my phone and it was like a whole big kerfuffle um, or kerfuffle. I don't know what the word is. So anyway, um, like people thought that that was a work. It was not a work. It and was real. I don't know if you guys know this. Did, did, did Joe tell me, is he here? Because am I talking about him and... I no, he, can't, he can't hear you yet. Have you guys cleared this up, or is this just this is the, this first, is the first time, time you've this talked? This is the first time we talked. <laughs> why and why I've did actually, he agree to come on? I've actually DM'd him, and he didn't respond. Wow. Uh, and, all uh, right. Uh, is yeah, he there? Yeah, he's arrived, so. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep but, but here's the other thing that you need to know. Oh, should I not say anything? Here's the other thing. Everyone says legit the toughest guy. in like If there's one guy you don't want to cross, if there's one guy you don't want to see at Starbucks <laughs> in the back, it's Booker T. Yeah. And so, you Starbucks know, like. Starbucks of all places. I love it. McAfee, Peter Rosenberg, these guys were telling me like, yo, man, like Booker ain't playing. Yeah. He's here. He is here? here? Oh, yeah. He's ready to go. Like right now? Oh, yeah. He's here. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you get to him. All right. Thanks, bud. Yeah. We'll see. Um, we'll see if we survive. All right. Well, uh, that's the. Uh, 
you know, that's the intro, but he was very, I mean, this guy, um, I was his biggest fan, biggest fan, had the shirt. I was supporting him. WCW comes over in the invasion, the freaking bookend. I mean, the scissor kick, the freaking spinner Rooney. I was his bigger fan. And unfortunately, there was, uh, you know, some bad influences in my life who steered me the wrong way. And so hopefully we'll be able to clear it up. And of course, uh, he was a big part of UFC 271 in his adopted hometown of Houston. He was there and asking probably better questions than any of the media. So without further ado, let's go to the Hall of Famer. Let's go to the man himself. There he is. The five time, five time, five time, five time. WCW champion Booker T. Now, Booker, thank you so much for doing this, my friend. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Just always working, always working. Well, I pre- look at this setup that you have over here. This is amazing. This in your house? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. This is my home studio here. You know, got Muhammad Ali here to the right. And actually, right behind me right here is me and the champ right here. You know, but uh, yeah, yeah, this is my, this is my little room here. Okay, well, I want to ask you about all this, but I, I need to sort of, you know address the elephant in the room here, Book, because in a previous life, you know, you know about this, like sometimes you run in the wrong circles, right? And there's people who are bad influences in your life. I used to run in a circle with a guy named Daniel Cormier. You may be familiar. He was a bad influence in my life. He would egg me on. He would try to get me into fights, you know, on his behalf. And so, you know, I may have said some things and I may have poked you and said, but you know, it was all out of line. Like that was all him. Right. So I apologize. Right. You know, that was all DC hey, just for the record. What? No, no apology uh, necessary, man. Uh, uh, that's what men do, man. Men are very confrontational. Everybody always talk about when they hear about a fight happening in the locker room and they, they sound surprised about it. And I'm like, man, come on. It's, it's a lot of testosterone flying around. Fights do happen sometimes uh, when you got men involved and um. I I look at us both uh, as men. That's right. Alpha males, dare I say. He's a beta. We're alpha. (laughs) And he was trying to egg me on to start a beef with you. And I just want to let you know that that was all him. I had nothing to do with it. And I was kind of being used as a puppet. I've seen my ways now. And so man to man, I just want to say I am sorry for the things that I said. Uh, I'm going to catch up with DC sooner or later, man. He's going to be ducking me, man. But I'm going to catch up with him. Because I just want to have a conversation. Oh. (laughs) Did you see him at the event? I saw you tweet him. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't run into him or uh-huh. anything. He was busy, man. He was running all over the place, and I, I totally understand when you're in that environment right there and you're in that work mode. Um, you're always about business. Okay, fair enough. All right. Well, I'm happy that we addressed that off the top. I'm very happy that you're here. And I have to say, uh, you know, I start, you know, I'm, I'm watching the post fight press conferences and whatnot, and I obviously hear your voice. You're asking great questions back there. So, and I know you do the show with Brad. ESPN Radio, 97.5, the Hall of Fame. You guys talk MMA and pro wrestling. But why did you want – I mean, you're a freaking Booker T, man. You're a legend. Why did you want to sit with the media and not, you know, in the stands and just enjoy the fight? Well, actually, uh, the media got the best seats in the house, man. <laughs> I mean, we're cage side. That's right. Uh, of his media. Um, but um, – that's something I've always had a passion for um, is boxing, um, MMA, uh, just combat sports in general. Um, I, I'm sure someone asked um, Frank Sinatra, why was he a photographer at Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier's fight? I'm sure it was because he loved it. I don't think it was because of the money or anything like that. And for me, um, um, just say, for instance, um, I, I, I know what my career was all about, and it was trying to make people feel a certain way. And uh, when the, when I watch those guys, they make me feel a certain way. So for me to, you know, just be a part of that world up close and personal, um, it's a dream come true. Wow. Um, when you see Izzy's reaction to you like that, right? Like he is genuinely excited after his big fight that he is talking to you, that you're there asking him a question. How does that make you feel? <sighs> Humbled. Um, in a word, um, just because it, it, it takes uh, sometimes um, guys like that to keep guys like me relevant. And I understand that. I get it. Um, it's just like Bad Bunny, you know, writing the song Booker T and then winning the Grammy. Um, that just opened up a whole different genre. And and I'm humbled. Um, so for, for Izzy to actually, you know, um, pay respect to Booker T. It just lets me know how I made him feel as a young kid growing up. Hopefully one day, um, hoping to ins- inspire just like I did. Do you ever see his spin Rooney? He's got a solid spin Rooney. 
Oh yeah, man. you can tell he was a fan though. Uh, you can tell he loves, uh, um, you know. I, I wouldn't just say you know what I did for him, but just the game of professional wrestling, entertainment. He's a he's a performer. Um, he's 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 the Muhammad Ali of the um, MMA world, and um, I tell you, uh, he's a generational talent. They only come along few and far between. So, what did you think of his fight, his performance? Some said, ah, uh, you know, it wasn't so entertaining. Some even thought some like fighters thought Whitaker won. You were up there. You know, cage side. What did you think of it? I mean, it, it was a it was a close fight. Uh, I can't sit here and say it wasn't a close fight. It was very strategic. Um, you could tell Whitaker um, went and you know changed a whole lot in his game, and he didn't want to go out the same way he did um, in the first fight. And, and you could tell, um, you know, Israel he was very very cautious um, as far as his approach. Um, he didn't want to get caught with anything either. So it was just a technical fight, but that's the way fights are. Every fight is not going to be that spectacular knockout or anything like that. Every fight is not going to be that that fight that we look back in history and say, man, it was great. But um, the fighter. Um, which I understand it's all about walking out with a W. Right. And I thought he did enough. Did you score it for him? Based on what yeah, you said? Yeah, I did. I, I scored it for him just because I didn't think uh, the takedowns from Whitaker was enough. He didn't actually establish the takedown enough. I, I'll do enough when he actually um, got the takedown for me to actually sway in his, uh, in his, uh, in his, in his way um, as far as that goes. Did you guys talk afterwards at all, like privately? Did you see him at the, you know, after the press conference, any words exchanged? Um, is he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we talked, man, and um, it, was, it was real, real cool, man. I'm just, you know, um, how much I um, uh, respect him. Um, and, and, you know, he, like I say, he was a big fan, uh, as, as you could tell. I knew he was, uh, I'm, I'm one of those guys to where I know what those guys are, are feeling after a, a fight or after a big show, man. You ready to get out of there? You ready to get to the hotel? Right. Uh, or you ready to get out uh, to the bar and hang out and party? Um, but um, I just, just want to, you know, uh, pay my respects for a second and say, man, um, it was awesome to sit here and um, uh, watch your fight and then to get a chance to ask a question uh, oh, to man. the champ as well was really, really cool for me. It was great. And his reaction to, uh, you know, the question was was tremendous as well, just to see how, you know, he, he was shocked that you were there and he was like, what am I hallucinating here? This is great. Um, what did you think of uh, Houston's own Derek Lewis? I, I was shocked by that finish. I saw you ask Dana White a question about um, Derek Lewis as well. What did you think of that fight? Yeah, um, Derek, he's he's always been a guy that's going to come in and swing and bang. Um, and, and my question was, you know, maybe I, I uh, you know, um, form, formulate the question uh, wrong. Um, and, and it wasn't that uh, I didn't think um, Derek Lewis had did a whole lot in the UFC. I just thought that every time he's gotten to that that moment, that moment that's going to put him over the top. Um, he's come up just a little bit short, um, taking nothing away from Derek Lewis or anything like that. But uh, tied to Ivasa, man, like he said at the press conference, he's young, he's hungry in the fight game, man. Any man that walk in that cage um, on any given um, Saturday night could be a winner or a loser, and Ty came to fight that night. When you see Ty doing his, doing his thing, do you get the flashbacks of Stone Cold back in the day? I mean, it's very Stone Cold. That's in the shoe as opposed to, you know, straight out of the can. But it looks a lot like the whole vibe is still cold, right? No, man, you know, uh, he's an entertainer. And and the guys in the business, uh, you know it, um, the guys in the business that, you know, catapult themselves to the next level, um, they got to be able to go out and make you, you know, you know, all eyes on me. You gotta, you gotta notice me. I gotta do something, and it's gotta be something outside of the square circle or the octagon. And Tatu Ivasa is definitely, um, he's putting himself on the map, man. He's a hell of a dude. Coming out to Cindy Lauper, girls just oh, want to have man. fun, things like that. Yeah. It's fun. See, the thing is, like, I, my fandom. Um, as far as MMA is concerned, is born from pro wrestling. Like, I was a pro wrestling fan first. And so what I am drawn to are the characters, right? The personalities, the characters, the people who stick out. And that's why it drives me crazy. And I wonder if you look at it through the same lens. When you see them all wearing the same thing, they're all, you know, they're in a uniform, so no one can stick out. Imagine if, you know, you and Stevie Ray back in the day are wearing the same thing as, you know, the Rock and Roll Express. And Ric Flair can't wear his outfit, and he looks like Hulk. You know, like, you can't do that in the fight game, right? You know what? Um... It just, you could sum it up um, in, in this right here, just alone. I don't think we would look at Tito Ortiz's career yes. if it wasn't for 
the TORTs that we remember. Right, right. I don't, I don't think so. I really don't. Uh, the flag, uh, yeah. the hat, you know what I mean? Uh, all of that for me, uh, that's what made MMA uh, what it was back in the day. Uh, ke- chemo. Um, uh, huh. I mean, can you can you picture that chemo yes. walking out with the cross on his back? For me, that's what I remember about the UFC, as well as the, the great combat. Um, let's not forget about that as well. Sure. Chuck Liddell also with those shorts, with the ice and all that. So it bums me out that they've uh, stripped the fighters. So when a guy like Ty can break through and be, you know, a fan favorite, it speaks a lot to his uh, his power. Can I ask, you know, since is, is, is he who's your favorite fighter right now? Is he is Izzy up there or is there someone else above him? You know, uh, Adesanya, he's probably uh, my favorite fighter right now just because he is the most dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the guy that, you know, you want to, you know, lay eyes on no matter, you know, where you're at or who he's fighting. Uh, of course, John Jones is a guy that's very captivating and you don't want to miss anything that he's doing, but uh, he's been out of the picture so long. We don't know what John Jones we're going to see when he does come back, right. if he does come back. So um, Izzy would be the guy. Yeah, you think John at heavyweight is a good idea? Well, any way you can make some money is a good idea. Sure, that is true. <laughs> as well as John Jones, um, he's always been the best. He's always been the best and until someone can prove us wrong. Um, no matter when he come back, if he come back, he's, he's going to be the favorite no matter who he fights. I, I, that's what I believe. I could okay. be wrong, um, but that's what I believe. So with Izzy, we saw a guy, Jared Cannonier, right before the Lewis fight win in a big way against Derek Brunson. You think Jared has a chance against Izzy? Man, um, a puncher's chance. Every every fighter got a chance when they go in that that octagon. Um, go back to Matt Serra, okay? Yeah. Uh, it, it, no one ever thought in a million years he was going to win that fight, but he went in there with a the puncher's chance, and 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 that's all it took. One big punch. Um, Cannonier can win that fight just because, man, he's a dog. He he's he's not going to quit. Brunson um, had that fight won. He, I mean, on, on all on all scorecards, Brunson had that fight won, but. Um, that's what you cannot um, predict in the fight game is how it's going to end up if, you know, you don't get that guy out of there and Cannonier proved it. Um, it's going to be a tough fight for um, um, Cannonier against Izzy just because um, he's not going to be um, in any one spot at any given time to be hit. Mm-hmm. And he's going to be on offense a- 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 uh, the whole time. That's the problem with Izzy. So right now, I, you know, I was talking about this not that long ago. Um, I like to compare the two industries, MMA and, and pro wrestling. And I think there's more similarities, honestly, between MMA and pro wrestling as opposed to MMA and boxing. Just by the way the, you know, the sport is constructed. You know, there's one big organization and then there's others. Which do you think is um, more interesting right now? Which, which of the two industries is, is doing better in your opinion? Uh, between uh, MMA and wrestling? Yeah. Um, man, um, I look at the two so, so separately, you know, okay. I mean, um, I, I just do, uh, just because, um, the UFC and, and what it brings to the table in professional wrestling, um, only, only way I look at professional wrestling in the MMA uh, along the same lines is where professional wrestling has to try to really walk that tightrope as far as trying to make it in real and we know it's entertainment but still trying to suspend the imagination of the fan to buy in um i think that that right there is is where um wrestling and mma um come into play but as far as fan base um it, from wrestling mma it's totally different i really think it's totally different even though um we got a lot of fans on both sides i'm yeah. a fan um, but I think MMA fans, man, they it's a different feeling in the arena for MMA. It's a different feeling in the arena for boxing. It's a totally different feeling for professional wrestling as a professional wrestler. I guess uh, the the question that I had was, you know, with WWE doing its thing, and now there's, you know, some competition, right? And I think competition breeds success. Rising tide lifts all boats. That, to me gives the sport a buzz. I mean, when you were in WCW and, you know, they were trying to go after um, WWF at the time, it feels like UFC is lacking that right now. Like, fans don't view... There's Bellator doesn't have the passionate fan base that AEW has, right? And so they're not like this conflict. That's what I mean about 
when I say I think wrestling is more interesting than MMA right now because at least there's this sort of, you know, debate going on and there are these fans who are saying our guys are better than your guys, that type of thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I think MMA really is, you know, especially the UFC, they're, you know, rolling in their own lane, just like the yes. um, Cyril Gunn and, and Francis Ngannou fight. I always say um, they're, they're kind of like WWE. Uh, people talk about, well, the ratings aren't like it used to be, but what they got, you know, contracts all over the world. And I think that's where um, the UFC is really trying to stake their flag, you know, it, like their champions. They want, they want international champions that's representing countries around the world so they can, that's just my opinion, sure. so they can make the most money at the end of the day, of the, of the day that they possibly get. I don't think it's about the fighter anymore and their flag and, and representing their, their brand and whatnot. I think it's about the, the, the shield, um, like the NFL. I, I, I agree with that as well. The brand name, the UFC, those three letters. For you, on a, on a Saturday night, big WWE or wrestling event, big UFC event, which, as a fan, do you enjoy more? As a fan, man, I got to say um, UFC uh, or boxing, you know, just because wow. I have a passion for it. Um, that, like, I, I love being in, um, you know, that environment. Um, it, it just is something totally different to watch the gladiators go inside. It, it takes a different type of person. It, they're different than you and I. Yeah. Um, that, that's that's willing to walk in that cage with, what, 20 plus thousand people watching um, the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. That right there for me, it doesn't get any bigger than that. That's 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 the gladiators. Uh, that's that's Caesar um, and all of that stuff back in the day, and you know, and, and, and the uh, you know the Coliseum. It's real as it possibly could be, man. And it doesn't get any better. Seriously, I had such a great time um, at the uh, fights um, just this weekend, and and I tell you, um, I can't wait to the next one. Uh, like Dana said, Texas, Florida, Texas, Florida. I'll yep. be there, I'll be there in Texas. <laughs> I love it. Um, now when. When you were in your prime, did you train in con like did you do boxing? Did you do any type of MMA to stay in shape? I, I actually trained, um, I wanted to be a boxer and um I started training and I actually got an opportunity to be a professional wrestler before I actually had a, a real fight or anything like that. Wow. And uh, I, I'm kind of glad. <laughs> <laughs> because the fight game is the fight game is rough. And um and uh, most of those guys just even though it's like that in professional wrestling. Those guys do not leave unscathed, yeah. um, and it's a uh, it could be a hell of a deal after their careers. That's why I'm a I'm an advocate for the fighter as well. I think these guys should get paid, you know, as much money as they um, they possibly can make um, for those fights they go out there and have because it is a, a life or death situation every time they step in there. Yeah, this is a hot topic in MMA right now. Fighter pay. Um, do you ever foresee a time when the fighters? can band together and have a little more of a say like the NFL players do, the NBA players do, et cetera. You know what? I, I, I think, I don't think it's going to um, come to that. I think it's going to um, end up being um, somewhat like boxing. Um, you're going to have to have um, a certain promoters and certain agents working for you to make you the most money. And it's always going to be kind of like professional wrestling. The top guys are going to be the guys that's going to be making the most money. It's just always going to be like that. But to be able to negotiate when you are good, when you are the top guy, you should get paid um, that money. When your name is on the marquee, like the, like we always used to tell The Rock, um, thanks for the house, brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It is, it's no different. And I think um, um, those fighters should get treated uh, no differently. That's, that's a very fair point. Well said. Um, how do you feel about the road to WrestleMania right now? Are you interested? What are you most interested in? This is, you know, you're also a part of the pre-shows with my good friend, uh, Mr. Peter Rosenberg. I know you guys watched Royal Rumble together in St. Louis at the Steakhouse. He was talking about that on his podcast. Sounds like a great time. How do you feel about, because as you, I'm not breaking any news to you, Royal Rumble, I think was kind of met with mixed reviews with Brock and Ronda, who happened to be two former UFC fighters coming back and doing their thing and winning the Royal Rumble. How do you feel about, you know, the buzz going into the biggest show of the year? Yeah, you know what, man, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. I've been, I've been doing this for, for so long now. Um, I'm going into my 31st year in professional wow. wrestling and, um, and, and, and WrestleMania for me has always been, you know, 
that time of year where we come out and we celebrate, we have a great time. We got to have a great show um, at the same time. And for me, I'm still at that, that, that stage right now. I love being around it. Um, I love watching the young guys um, come up and do their thing. And I'm going to be there to um, make sure I give my, my words of wisdom um, as far as what's going on. But I got a lot going on that weekend myself, reality of wrestling. We got four, four shows going on. Uh, with uh, World Class Pro, and uh, we got an all-women show, the first inaugural Sherry Martell Classic. So I got a lot of work going on. I'm sure I'm going to have WWE duties as far as, you know, autograph signings and whatnot. So I, when, when I when I do that, um, at that time of year, it's time to put my hat, my hard hat on, go to work, get the work done, and um, help <laughs> – Get, get the thing over with uh, so we can get to next year and do it all over again. Fair enough. Uh, do you like the role that you're in in the company or would you like to be doing other stuff? Like how, how content are you with the role? Because right now, correct me if I'm wrong, you do the pre-shows and that is, is that it? Are you, are, do you work in the back as well? No, I just do the kickoff show. Yeah. Um, I got a, a few other opportunities on the table that I'm, getting ready to start doing here in a little bit uh, with WWE, but I got my wrestling school. Um, I got the radio show, um, you know, I'm part of a betting site. I got, I got like so much stuff going on right now. It's not even funny. I, I love what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. I don't want to stop. I, I'm so content um, being where I am right now. And, and I think um, I'm, I'm more so content because this, is, this has been my plan. I, I never had a plan in life as far as how I was going to make it. But once I, I, I found myself in the door um, and I got into WCW, I remember I was 30 years old and I was trying to figure out you know, how I was going to retire, what I was going to do next. And this is it. Um, you know, people say, you know, like I say, uh, you know, city, see, see me there with the, in the media room, you know, asking questions. I'm not doing it because of uh, um, the money or anything like that. But I realized those correspondents, those guys, they call journalists. Those guys make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, let me try to see if I can finagle my way into that, <laughs> you know, because um, I think, uh, you know, uh, in the press call, my, my questions was just as good as any journalist yes. uh, that was asking questions. I think um, I was able to relate with the um, the fighters uh, more so than the journalists. So I think I, I fit right in. I fit, I fit in perfectly. You want to do more of that? Oh, I'm going to be at um, pretty much all of the fights uh, um, doing that. Um, that's my job um, um, going forward to uh, get as much um, content as I possibly can and, and find myself into a, you know, a different role and, and still try to, you know, you know, have fun in life and smile every day. Um, it, 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 life is the hardest thing you're ever going to deal with in life. It really is. And um, if you can figure it out, um, it ain't so bad. Are there any guys in the back or girls in the back at uh, WWE right now that you have kind of taken under your wing that maybe you're not working in an official capacity as a producer or agent, but you said you were going to go in the back, talk to some youngsters, things like that. Are there any ones that you are working with and, and helping along the way? You know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm more so often to working with the talent that's trying to get to the next level. Like, you know, one of my girls just debuted on, um, AEW Dynamite with um, Jay Cargill. Her name's AQA. And uh, they just, you know, signed her to a contract. It's really, really cool. One of my girls, um, Roxy WWE, just signed her. She was my youngest champion um, in reality of wrestling. Um, started with me um, at Fantasy Camp. She was at 13 years old. A dream wow. was to be the reality of wrestling champion. Um, you know, um, I got, you know, guys out there floating around all over the world right now. And that's, that's my passion. Literally. That's my passion. Just, uh, working with young guys from a, um, in ring perspective, from a mental perspective, from just a life perspective. Um, I don't know why, I don't know why, but, uh, it, it gives me purpose. Oh yeah, I bet. And, and when you have these young people like turn into, you know, stars on the roster or make it, I'm sure as a proud, you know, you're almost like a proud father seeing them kind of graduate. By the way, uh, Sherry Martell Classic, that sounds amazing. I mean, I know she was a part of your, you know, career early on. So you're going to have an all women's show and the winner will be crowned the first ever, as you said. Did you say Sherry Martell? That's what you refer to her as? Uh, yeah, yeah, Sherry Martell in inaugural. Yeah, yeah uh, invitational. Yeah, they, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome, Mister uh, Sherry. It was really really close uh, to me, um, near and dear to my heart. I was there with her um, all the way to the end, and um, I, I think she would be you know proud to 
you know, have something like yeah. this in their memory. Um, so for me, um, to be able to do it, uh, it is so awesome because Sherry Montel, she was special um, to me and as well as so many other people. And I think the fans are going to get a, a big kick out of this. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be um, it's going to be awesome going down on Saturday morning um, down in Dallas, um, Junction City. So um, go to the website, go to realityofwrestling.com and um, get your information. It's going to be on Fight TV as well. Oh, nice. Um, so if you're not there, you can still be able to see it um, as well. Any of your kids want to fall in your footsteps? You know, my, my son, he's a big wrestling fan. Uh, my daughter, uh, she's off into it as well. But, if, if, you know, they're not at that stage right now um, um, from, the, from the wrestling side. They are there from the business side. Um, I have my son with me um, in the war room, um, listening to the angles, um, knowing what it, what it really, really means to, uh, you know, be a general and uh, take charge. Um, and not, not just that, to, but to know that you got to have a great team around you in order to make it work. Uh, my daughter more so, um, is ready to, you know, get in the ring and run. But, uh, my, my son, I'm teaching him the business side because, um, I, I really don't, I really don't have any aspirations or dreams, uh, for him to be a professional wrestler. Okay. Uh, two last quick things for you, if I may. I remember when you transi- transitioned over from WCW to WF and or WWE, and the hair was growing a little. I've always wanted to ask you this: Is this still the same byproduct of the hair? Like when you put the, had the hair kind of growing out a little bit, have you not yeah. cut it since then? I haven't cut it since then, man. Damn. Twenty. 20- one years of, of hair right here. I'm trying to hold on to it and top, you know uh-huh. what I mean? <laughs> they always say that's the first to go and it's getting a little thin up there, but uh, I'm, I'm, I work on it like it's a chia pet. Wow. <laughs> why, why did you let it grow? I said, oh, got the good. You know what? Um, I, I just, um, I say, I have a saying, you know, if you don't know how to keep up with the times, the times will pass you by. I can honestly say this and I believe it 100%. If, if I still had the flat top and the fade um, uh, with the little mustache, I don't think you and I would be having this conversation right now. I would have faded away. I would have, you wow. know, blended in with all the other old guys. And for me, I'm always trying to stay relevant um, because in this life, um, you don't have to be the top guy. You don't have to be top of the food chain. Um, if you just stay relevant, um, everything will be all right. Wow. Okay. Uh, and how often do you, are, are those like, uh, braided or are those, is that like, uh, it's, it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't move. It's, it doesn't move. It's locked in. That's I don't touch it. I say, God got the clippers, you know what I mean? And, um, uh, when he get ready to use them, um, I'll be, I I'll love- be ready to sit out in that chair. <laughs> One of your most uh, famous moments of course, was the, uh, the, the grocery store match against uh, Stone Colder. Not a match, but like the, the, just the whole, whatever you want to call it. Um, it was a match. It was a match. Okay, fine. If you want to call it that. Uh, what what do you remember most? Of, like, if is there something that we didn't see about that shoot, about that day, that fans would get a kick out of? Because still all these years later, people are talking about it. People love them. It's incredible. You know, I think that's what's different about um, what wrestling is today. Um, I, I love the business. I love what... Um, what we did back then and how we tried to create and make fans um, feel a certain way. Um, today is, is totally different. It's, it's kind of toxic uh, and the fans uh, make it that way um, as well. But back then you had Stone Cold Steve Austin, who was a legitimate badass, And then you got Booker T who's a legitimate badass. And we're doing an angle with Stone Cold Steve Austin is chasing me all over the place. He chased me in a bingo hall. He chased me in a confessional. Um, and then he finally caught me in a grocery store. What the hell? Why would, you know, so cool and I did the grocery store together at the same time. We, we don't live in the same neighborhood. So how the hell that happened? But but uh, uh, back then, it was all about going out there and making those fans feel a certain way. We got the script, and we said, let's see if we can make this um, um, the best script we possibly can. Let's enhance it. Let's just um, go outside of ourselves and 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 have some fun and be stupid. Um, this business is um, one of those businesses where you got to be able to laugh at yourself. I've always been able to laugh at myself um, and because, you know, hey, I'm, I'm – I'm having fun. You know, I have a kid that grew up in the ghetto. Uh, meals were hard to come by. When I got in the business, hey, everything was pretty good. So for us to go out there and create magic um, that we didn't know was going to last this many years later, but we knew, man, let's just go out here and do the best we possibly can and have the stupidest fun um, one could ever have and see what we create. And 20 years later, 
is still something. It's crazy. He is, they even watch my career. They watch that video and they know who I am and they like me. It's crazy. That is crazy. Considering all that you've done, by the way, how does that work? Do they, they shut down the place and then they pay for everything after? Cause you guys like you wrecked that place. Yeah, man. I don't know how much the bill was. Yeah. I always wonder what the, what the bill was um, as far as that shoot, but it was one take, you know, it really was action. It was like, I'm serious. It was action, man. And we just started going, man. And we went all the way through that store, all the way through the back, all the way out. Uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, Stone Coast Steve at Austin, price check on the jackass. Uh, all of that was improv. Everything was improv. It was, it was stupid. And I say, if they did that same shoot today, it'll be a, you know, a script, like three pages. It will be like um, five cameras. It'll be a lighting crew. It was none of that, man. It was just camera, action, go. And, uh, that's what we created. Man, what a legend you are. Massive respect for you, Booker T. Thank you so much. I'm happy we buried the hatchet. I just want to let you know, if you're mad at me for anything, it's all DC's fault. All right. It's all DC's <laughs> fault. He made me do it. That Benedict Arnold. Okay. He's the bad influence. It's all good, man. It's all good, man. I'm glad we buried the hatchet too, man. Cause you, you always been one of my favorite guys, man. You always been one of those guys that's been gracious every time we've asked you to come on the show and um, give us some, some, some wisdom. Um, you've always been there for us. So man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, and I don't hold any of the things you said about me and my physique. I mean, I forgot all about it. Just like, you know, I, it's water under the bridge, Booker. It's water under the bridge. Much love, my man. Thank you. You got it, bro. All of that. All right. There he is. Booker T, the legend, the five-time WCW champion. See, that's how you make it happen. That's how you make it happen. You let them know that sometimes there are people in your life who are bad influences. I will never let that man. Of course, I honor him, you know, on the on, on the wall over here. But he was the one that made me do it. I, I'm I'm a respect. I'm a I'm a student of the game. I'm a respectful, appreciative fan of what people like Booker. T I mean, I was there at Invasion 2001 at WWF New York at the time before they got the F out. I think they did at that point. Maybe they didn't. Uh, no, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't get the F out yet. Watching. I was watching WCW Spring Stampede. I would never disrespect a legend like Booker T. Ever. And so I just want to let you all know uh, that was all DC's fault. Now, uh, you can check out more of Mr. Booker T and his co-host Brad Gilmore, who is a, a great writer in his own right. Uh, actually wrote uh, a book on Back to the Future. He's a big Back to the Future guy, uh, which I have and which I enjoyed very much on 97.5 and 92.5 FM ESPN Houston. You could also get it online as well. So um, check it out. They do a great job covering MMA and pro wrestling. All right. Thank you very much. That was a lot of fun. Book is the man. And he did do a good job. And that clip, I should have had the clip, the clip of Izzy seeing that uh, he was in, it, he asks him a question. He doesn't say, hey, this is Booker T. And uh, Izzy's like, what the? Is that Booker T? It was great. It was great. It was like he was having an out-of-body experience. Like, wait a second, I just won this big fight. And now Booker T is asking me a question. This is incredible. So I'm happy that he was able to come on. Um, in a matter of seconds, we're going to have one half of the headliner for this weekend's UFC event. Um, it was supposed to be RDA versus Rafael Faziev. And then I reported Friday morning that Rafael, unfortunately, couldn't get his visa approved in time. I'm told he did everything that he could do. I'm told this is in his fault. Uh, but unfortunately, the fight fell through. And so as a result, they bumped it to the co-main event of UFC 272 on March 5th in Las Vegas. That's the one headlined by Jorge Masvidal versus Colby Covington. And now that's going to be the co-main. And honestly, I used to get questions all the time, as you know, over the last few weeks when we're doing On the Nose, what's going to be the co-main? I mean, I think it's a fine co-main. I think that card got bumped uh, to another level. Uh, it got beefed up. It improved. And now on Saturday, it's uh, going to be Johnny Walker against Jamal Hill. Um, and this is an important fight for Johnny Walker because you'll recall he headlined the show back in uh, October 
against Thiago Santos. And there was a lot of talk going into that fight about, you know, taking him to hell and knocking him out and all this stuff. And it didn't really pan out as one of the more uh, entertaining fights of 2021. And so I think that there's some kind of pressure on him to uh, to get back on track. And Jamal Hill is coming off a very impressive win over Jimmy Crute, excuse me, back in December. It was the fruit. I'll be honest. It was the fruit. Sorry about that, Frank. I guess he's not there. You should like to say something. Let me say it again. Uh, Jimmy Crute, he knocked out back in December in just uh, 48 seconds. Jamal Hill also has a TKO win over Ovin St. Pru. Had a uh, TKO win over Klitsin Abreu, but that was uh, overturned after he tested positive for marijuana and also a, a product of the uh, Contender Series. So that's the new main event. And I would say that all of a sudden UFC 271 is, you know, look, they don't sell tickets, or at least they don't sell a lot of tickets to the 272. Uh, 271 that was this past weekend. They don't sell a lot of tickets to these Apex events. So there's not that same kind of pressure to find a replacement. And they do sell tickets to the pay-per-views. They do sell pay-per-views as well. And so now I think that uh, 272 benefited from getting RDA versus Fiziev, of course, RDA, I mean, the bad luck that this guy has had with his fights as of late is crazy. But uh, all of a sudden, this is a nice little pay-per-view, and we're getting uh, two young studs at 205 in the main event this weekend. I say young. Jamal Hill, 30. Yeah, wow. Jamal Hill's older than Johnny Walker. How about that? Johnny Walker, 29. The main card now for 272 is Colby Covington versus Jorge Masvidal, Edson Barbosa versus Bryce Mitchell. I'm really looking forward to that. That's a big-time fight at 145. Kevin Holland uh, back at 170 going up against Alex Oliveira and Sergey Spivak against Greg Hardy. They're still on this Greg Hardy kick. For some reason, he always gets prime real estate on these main cards. Now, he has lost two in a row, and so, and he lost them via finish, KO and TKO to the aforementioned Tai Tuivasa and Marcin Taibora. This would be a big one for him, but uh, I like that. Also, the featured fight on the prelims is a really important one at 115. Marina Rodriguez against Jan Shaunan. Rodriguez, Rodriguez has looked very good as of late. All right, um, enough for me. Let's say hello to our next guest, our final guest of the day. He is one half of the main event this weekend in Las Vegas. The aforementioned Johnny Walker, kind enough to join us now. Johnny, my friend. Oh, I like that background. How are you? Hey, how are you? I'm good, my friend. How are you doing? This is your logo. Yeah, this is my logo. I like it. I like it. Who made that? Is that friend in Brazil? He, he draw for me. I like, like that. me. It looks a lot like you, yes. You're going to have that on a t-shirt? Yeah, I'm going to try to build one brand, clothes brand, you know, soon. So this is my logo to start. Respect, respect. I like it. That's good branding there. Um, so when you found out that you were now the main event, what did you think? I think amazing. I'm so happy, so glad that say so much thank you for God and for this opportunity again. You know? So I'm so happy, so excited. So this three rounds or five rounds? I don't care, my friend. I have no idea. I don't ask. I just want to fight. Come on. You didn't ask? No. Why? I just I mean, want to fight. I don't care if it's three, four. I can fight 20 rounds. So no matter for me, three or five. I think it's five. It's okay. Yeah, but you I didn't need that much. You didn't train for five. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> you don't think it's going to go past 15? Not much. This guy want to come with everything. Then I go as well. So we're gonna finish the fight early. Okay. Um, and uh, you, know, you know, I think there's there's a couple reasons why people. Would care. I was trying to fight fast as well. So. You always do that. Okay. All right. Yeah. They they pay you more when you become main event. I think so, right? Yeah, a little bit. That's good. That's good. Um, that's a good byproduct of being in the main event. Now I'm curious. I was talking before you came on. You know, I spoke to you right before the Tiago Santos fight when you fought him in October, and obviously that fight didn't go your way. Do you feel? Any kind of pressure now to try to, you know, win the people back to to show them that that's not the real Johnny Walker. 
No, really, no pressure. Never pressure. No, this is my career, it's my life. You know, nobody pay my bills. I have to produce my own money to pay my bills. So it's my responsibility to come go there and put the show on, make the bono, get the bonus, you know. And I'm focused on that. I don't focus on nobody else that what they say or what people think. I know if I do a good job, everybody's going to be glad to watch. So this is my plan. What are your thoughts on the Santos fight now? Now that it's over several months ago, what went wrong in that night? Uh, I think uh, he's a really good fighter, right? And he's high level. He fought, have more experience than me with five rounds, like main events. And he know how to, to win by points, you know, and... We saw that the fight is going to go by points, so he probably have more experience to, to get the fights on points. And I was too too long without fighting. So I got a surgery, one year of fighting, so no much time, you know. So, And uh, he's Brazilian as well. I feel weird to beat him up, you know, like uh, I want to. So we just like fights. It just was a really, weird really fight. I, I don't really like. And he's very defensive as well, and he's a good fighter, so... This time, it's going to be different, 100%. Mm. You don't like fighting Brazilians? Not really. He's from my seat as well. No? Like, I uh. feel like, you know, weird. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and do you feel like it was, uh, I guess, the way you were describing, like almost like a frustrating fight for you because you felt like he was waiting for you to attack, that he was defensive, counterpunching, and you couldn't get going? Yeah, probably, probably was for both of us, you know. The game doesn't matter much. I don't know what's happened. It's just like he was very defensive and move a lot, and me as well. And we are very caution, but we just don't. The game doesn't fit. We throw some punch, but you know, like he he was waiting for me to make mistake, and I wait him for make mistake. And the little mistake that happened, he probably get the fight on. So it just happened, you know. Mm. Uh, I remember when you told me before the fight that uh, you know you were gonna take him to hell. Yeah. Remember that? I, yeah, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> Didn't happen. So I, I'm assuming no. you were very, like that, was that one of your more disappointing fights of your career because you had such high expectations for it? It's not really. I get a lot of experience, you know, I fought five rounds and I take some good shots and uh, I took yeah. good and uh, I understand more my body. I know I can go through five rounds and, you know, more time in the octagon with a high level fighter is more experience for me. So it's not frustrating. Like get the experience, you know, is a win or learn. Mm -hmm. Like the great John Kavanaugh says, will he be in your corner this weekend? Uh, John Kavanaugh and Michelle Pereira. Oh, what a duo. Just them two? Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about because my other corner got COVID, so it's not coming. So I was oh. we're going to put. You can put your fiance. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Has she ever been in your corner? No, I'm not gonna put she. She gonna she, she gonna throw the the the, the towel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If you get one punch, um, we saw that this weekend with the the fights. Did you watch the fights this weekend? Oh yeah, what's well, amazing! So excited. So yeah, nice. which one did you like the best? Which fight did you? Uh... Uh, Louis Faza and Derek Lewis. Yes, come on, those guys. I... Crazy elbows, cannoneer yeah. too. Yeah, you like I Izzy? Like... Boom boom. Yeah, Izzy, good performance, you know. But uh, it was close fights as well, you know? Yeah. yeah. Who do you think won? Bro, I think it, he is the champ, you know? If you want to beat the champ by points, you have to beat the shit out of the champ to win by points. Because he's the champ, he's defending his, his legacy, his belt. So you're the challenge. The challenge have to really beat the champ, champ up to, to get the belt. Mm -hmm. So so you're okay with Izzy winning? Out. You can leave the doubts for the reference. You can leave the doubts, you know. When you um, are watching a big pay-per-view, a big show like that, and you're about to fight the next weekend, do you, do you get uh, motivation? How do you feel? Because like, you're next, right? You're the next show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Is it, is it different than when you're watching like just a regular show and you're fighting in two months? The the, the feeling inside? Next week's my time, so I just want to go. I, I was watching it, and I was like, throw some elbows, doing some skits like, like yeah, come yeah, on yeah. come on you know you feel excited you feel like next week's mine is me but you have to take it easy don't get too excited don't just, get too crazy yeah so i think um i think you benefit from fighting in front of people right like you you like that energy you yeah, like of course and the last three fights weren't in front of people right they were uh well one was empty brasilia then the the next two were at the apex this one again at the apex 
uh, there's going to be a few people there, but it's not going to be like a big arena. Do you, do you really miss that, that energy of having the people there? Yeah, 100% I miss that. But, you know, when day is going to come, uh, I can't wait for fight for the, the crowds again. But, yes, it is what it is, you know. I have to wait to do my way for now and wait until my day come back. Does it feel like a little bit off when you're fighting in front of no one? Yeah, it's like weird because I like to, to do the show. I like to feel the, the crowd energy and make the people scream, you know, with good good punch, good fights. And I like to, to, to put the show on, you know. Without people, I just have to focus, fight and look my my corner. is like a little bit depressed, like nobody's <laughs> watching. I know people watching at home, but it's not the same one. You have the crowd and the energy. It's like the collision. On, right. They're going out. So it's a little bit weird, but... It is what it is. I just have to keep fighting. One day I'll come up back for the crown. Did you know who Jamal Hill was when you were offered this fight? Ah, of course. He's coming to good straight wins and he fought good guys. But then I fought somebody with my level, you know, with my size, with my power. So he's a good opponent. I respect him and have good box. You know, everybody in the top team have to respect. Everybody have knockout power. Everybody have knowledge enough. To, to do everything that they want because, you know, it's the, the best fight in the world in the, in the division. He, so he's older than that. you. Yeah, one year, I think. Yeah, that's crazy. I feel like because uh, you've been around longer, I was uh, surprised that he was, uh, I mean, just one year, not a big deal, but um, I viewed him as like a younger guy in the game, but you're you're the, uh, the you're not even 30 yet, Johnny. You're 29. Uh, you're just yeah. a little baby. Little baby. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm doing good and, a lot of experience now, so I'll be good soon, my friend. I'm going to put my legs on and just keep going, you know, move forward. You're, you're liking life in Ireland? Yeah, it's good, but I miss Brazil. I miss the heat, you know, the sun. Yeah. There's a little bit of the rain a little bit. It's a really nice life, good friends there, but, you know, I miss the weather, good weather from Brazil. Do you think and you'll some... move back? Not really, but... You know, there's a good train there, a few at home. So I'm going to keep training there because I'm, I improve a lot. But after this fight, probably I'm going to go to Thailand to do a little bit of training camp there. Oh. After my mind. Uh, a Tiger Muay Thai? Probably Tiger or AKA. Oh, wow. Okay. Those are two great ones. They're doing really well there. They have a lot of great fighters. Uh, why Why do you want to go there? Uh, because I, I miss a little bit the, the traditional Thai pads, you know. Sh- sharpening my 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 weapons like more, you know. Long time I don't have. I have good Thai pads, guys. You know, I I, I work a lot of my boxing, but you know the, the my Thai roots every day like special. You work just this kind of technique, mm-hmm. so helps to improve, you know. So I'm gonna spend probably two three weeks there just to train my Thai. Kind of holiday as well. Get some sun. Yes. And um, learn and improve. I saw that uh, you you went to the world famous Louis Copeland store in uh, in Ireland. That's where Connor would go to get his suits. Did you uh, did you get an in because you're an SBG guy? Yeah, I get a nice suit. Nice. I'm gonna be other level now. I lo- what, you're gonna be what? I'm gonna be another level now. Oh, another level. Okay, I like it. A nice little uh, uh, custom suit for you. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well done. Um, and could I ask, you know, when I spoke to you last, Glover hadn't won the belt yet. What did you, as a felt, you know, you love your country to see a Brazilian legend like him finally win the belt a few uh, weeks later at 205. How did you react to that? Oh, I was so happy for him, bro. I, I knew that it's going to happen. And I just happy. He, he was, he's a veteran. He was on this game for so long and now he's get what he, he was wishing for and all. I just get so happy for him. And now he's going to defend his belt against Giri. I'm sure he, he's going to do well as well. But I hope he just put him down quickly and choke yeah. him. Because Giri is a very unpredictable as well and a good striker, right. you know, and big and young. So, but, you know, Glover have a lot of experience, really tough. But I'm sure if you take him down, Jiu-Jitsu is going to be the difference. I'd like to see you versus Giri at, at one point. One day you're going to meet soon. Okay. You like that idea? I mean, just because you have both. Of course. I want to have fun. I want to have fun. I think it's going to be so much fun fighter. I like to fight. No? I had a lot of fun with Thiago. I was enjoying the fights. You know? So with Giri, going to be the same. But he's not from my neighborhood. 
right, right. My city, so. so that's a, yeah, a lot better for you. Okay, so how does it end on Saturday? Bro, I'm gonna do my 100% to finish the fights. I don't want to leave my fights anymore on the half ranks because I train so much. I, I come through a hard, you know, history. And I'm gonna put everything on, on the, the edge of my glove this Saturday. And I'm gonna do my best. But there's a fine line, right? You don't want to mm-hmm. push too much. You don't want to push too much to get the finish and then, you know, fight outside of your game and be impatient and all that stuff, right? No. I'm going to be very professional. I'm going to be use all my lab, all of my experience, you know. I'm going to be explosive. I'm going to be unpredictable, you know. I'm going to use all of my weapons, but I'm going to take my time as well. I'm going to just be another level. You, know? you have to be another level. And I'm going to do that. I look forward to it, my friend. Good luck to you on Saturday. Uh, congrats on getting bumped to the main event. I'm happy they paid you a little more as well. And uh, I think it's five rounds. Just for the record, I think it's five, but maybe you want to double check. I don't want to need it. You're not going to need it. That's right. That's right. Uh, thank you, Johnny. Good luck to you. Obrigado. Thank you very much. Take All right. care. There he is, Johnny Walker, uh, one half of the main event this Saturday against Jamal Hill in Las Vegas at the Apex. I heard that they are going to expand the apex to um, 750 now. They're trying to do it to 750. So they're going to make that money. It's very cheap for them to run the apex so they don't have to travel and all that stuff. Kyle Dawkins versus Jamie Pickett. Parker Porter against Alan Baudot. Jim Miller against Nicholas Mata. Joaquin Buckley against Abdul Razak Al-Hassan. Jessica Rose Clark against Stephanie Egger. Rose Clark, uh, or Jessica Rose Clark. So I guess it's just Clark because her name is Jessica Rose, right? Not Jessica Rose Clark. It's Jessica Rose Clark. Um, On a two-fight winning streak. Training at AKA, Chaz Skelly. So there you have it, this Saturday. All right. Thank you, Johnny Walker. Thank you to all our guests. One more thing to do, and let's not waste any time. Time now for everyone's third favorite segment of the week. It is time. And now it's time to open up your ears and your minds, MMA fans. It's time for Rick's Picks. Yes. Rick's Picks. Rick's, Rick's picks. picks are lots of fun. Yes. His hair is in a bun because it's, you already know what it is. Rick's Picks. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Yes. It's the moment you've all been waiting for. It's the new craze taking the world by storm. Uh-huh. Live from the Vox Studios in beautiful New York City, it's time for... Rick's Picks! Yeah! Bang! There he is. Hello. Still no decorations. No, nah, I mean, look, connor has got us covered. Like, it's leaking into mine, uh, so I don't even have to I mean, do I feel like you're, you're benefiting from his hard work. I, yeah, no doubt. Um, that, that's kind of the arrangement that's going on here. I'm going to let Connor keep uh, expanding and expanding. You know, he's running out of room over here. It's going to grow to my side, and then I don't have to do anything. Unbelievable. I'm just going to have my fruit. (laughs) Just keep it casual. Mm -hmm. So, yes. who won on Saturday? Uh, Israel Adesanya won. Scorecard? For me, I think I had it at the time, uh, first four rounds to Izzy. Um, I think the best arguments are, are round two was close. Uh, and I think you can make an argument that Whitaker won four and five. Uh, not how, not you know, not my personal scorecard watching it, but I think that's the the, the best arguments that I've seen and or or seen put forth. Uh, but I also don't think that Israel was in, in any real danger. Um, even when Whitaker was getting the takedowns, he was popping right back up or controlling the the exchanges and able to get out really uh, quickly. Um, I think a credit to to what he's been working on. Um, so yeah, no, I, I had it four to one at the time on a rewatch. I might have it three to two. Um, but I thought Israel Adesanya won that fight. Impressed? Yeah. Cause I think Robert Whitaker is that good. I think, you know, Whitaker said this, I, I forget if Israel, I think Israel kind of like tacitly acknowledged this. Um, it's those two and then everybody else, in my opinion. Um, and I, and I think there's a level between, between both of them as well. I think Israel's on a different level. Um, but yes, I, I think Robert Whitaker is very clearly the number two in that division. Um, and everybody else is underneath that. So 
very impressed. I think if that Israel fought Marvin Vittori, I think that outcome would have looked a little mm. bit different too. He was a little bit listless in that fight. Um, he was sharp. And he was against a guy who's very, very good in Robert Whitaker. So yes, impressed uh, and continue to be with Israel Adesanya. I was uh, a little surprised at the pushback that I got about, not that it was my idea, but when I wrote about like Cannoneer, like, oh God, we're not, like, I was like, what? You guys, it, that was a great win. Like, I thought that was the exact kind of win to get you excited. Expand on that. Like, what do you mean? What What did you say? Oh, I got a lot back? of people who are like, oh, I have no interest in this fight. Silly. He has no chance. I mean, that's a credit to Israel Adesanya, in my opinion. Yeah, we just saw Julian Pena beat Amanda Nunes. Yeah. You're telling me well, that Cannoneer can't win? This is that sport, right? Like, this is the sport where those things do happen. Um, I think Jared Cannoneer has as good a shot as any of Israel Adesanya's recent competition outside of Robert Whitaker. I think 100%. The, like, if, if you're putting uh, Marvin Vittori or Paulo Costa in that fight... Um, I think Cannoneer has as good a chance as either of those two. So, 100%. yeah, I, th I think that's very silly. And if he would have won some sort of, like, you know, lackluster decision, then I would have said, like, all right, I get it. It wasn't the type of win to get you excited. That was a great fight. Great fight. And we don't have to go that far back from him nearly decapitating uh, Robert Whitaker around three of their fight as well. Right. So, um, I think uh, Jared Cannonier has has uh, a decent chance there um, to, to give a good account of himself. Again, I would I would side with Israel. I think there's a gap between him, Rob, and the rest of the division. Um, but no, that's that's absolutely insane to to not be interested in in Cannonier as a viable opponent. I'll tell you this: I'm more interested in that than Sean Strickland. Yeah, for now. I think Strickland presents some interesting problems with his jab and his... Yeah, I don't. No? I think no. he presents some interesting, th you know... Pre-fight uh, problems? Pre-fight problems and conversation. Cannoneer do deserves think, it. Come on. I do not think that fight is going to be very, you know... Like, I think he will He will be in that fight. Um, I respect uh, Strickland's technical abilities. Again, the jab is nice, but if, if your best tools are you're going to engage in a striking battle with Israel Adesanya, you're going to lose, period. End of story. There isn't a guy on the roster at middleweight who's going to do a better um, job striking than Israel Adesanya. Uh, that doesn't feel like a good strategy to me. I think there's an opportunity for Cannoneer to have it mixed up a little bit more, to be a little more um, aggressive on the inside, potentially get Israel down. And if he's on top, that's that's going to be a real problem. Um, so yeah, I'm more interested in that fight than Strickland from a from a technical standpoint, in, in my opinion. Jared Cannonier made his UFC debut January of 2015 as a heavyweight, lost to Sean yes. Jordan. I mean, and this guy has then fought at um, light heavyweight, light heavyweight and as well, yeah. middleweight. I mean, the guy's put in the time, and his lone loss dating back to, you know, it, well, sorry, his lone loss period as a middleweight is to Robert Whitaker. Right, and as I said, if you watch round three of that fight, he had Whitaker yeah, yeah. on the ropes there. That was not, um, you know, not <laughs> honestly, not dissimilar to the Derek Brunson fight, except he was able to get it done right. against Brunson and not get it done um, against Whitaker. Again, you know, credit to Whitaker on that and, and a, a good performance by him. But yeah, uh, I think anybody who's trying to discredit Cannoneer's case for this um, hasn't been watching, quite frankly. What do you do with Ty now? It's a tricky one, right? It's a tricky one. Um, I would like to see him get a fight against the 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 top guy who's who's right before a title shot. I mean, if we assume that Francis Ngannou is not coming back, um, and that there's going to be an interim title established, the winner of let's say a Steve Bay versus Jones makes sense to me. Wow, that big. Well, who's after? Who's above Derek? I was thinking what? like the winner of Aspinall against Volkov. Oh come on! Oh, so you so yeah? I mean, if Ty wants to do somebody a favor, sure. But well, look for me right now, Derek Lewis. Um, I'm just gonna go off the UFC rankings just to because I know this is the was, way they look at he things. Was three, yeah. He was three, and uh, Aspinall was ten. Excuse me, and Ty was eleven. Aspinall is currently ten, so he's probably gonna get bumped up. But I don't. If Aspinall wins this fight, they're sort of in the same. Or what about? Again, the reason I bring this up isn't because I don't think he has earned it or deserves it. Yeah. You got to figure out what's going to happen with Stipe. You got to figure out what's going to happen with Jones. And you got to figure out what's going to happen with uh, with Francis when he comes back. So there's a bit of a log jam. If you're Ty, you could wait. You could wait. And I think you could get that fight. I think you could get a Jones Miocic winner. Um, if but that I don't fight think even Ty, happens. If that fight even happens, but maybe he gets to fight um, Miocic then. Or maybe he gets to fight Jones then. Who knows? I mean, historically, Stipe hasn't 
shown much interest fighting non champions. He has to fight at some point, right? He's going to have to fight. What about Blades Dacus? No, this see, I mean, if I'm thinking of this perspective of the perspective Docus of like, number seven. could I get Blades Tai Tuivasa to fight down and fight somebody that he's going to be above? Sure, and he probably would do it. Just be, he he reminds me a bit of like um, Max Holloway in the sense that like yeah, he's game. He'll take a fight with anybody. Um, he doesn't mind being the one to fight before like. Max takes a fight with Yair Rodriguez and is like, cool, I'll just win this and then get my title shot. Like, mm -hmm. he's that type of dude. Um, I think Ty's the type who wants to stay busy. I wouldn't be surprised if he takes his fight. From a strategic perspective, I think Ty Tuivasa would be best positioned to fight up and to wait for an opportunity because I think he deserves that. I think this run he's on is worthy of that, and I think he would have a good chance against the top of the heavyweight division. I know you know this, but just a little PSA, which I feel like I've said before on the program. Um... Nothing pisses me off more than the, you should get so-and-so on the show or why didn't you get so-and-so on the show? Can I just say to the public? <laughs> Is this in regard to Tai Tuivasa? Let me just say to the public, <laughs> if you think I should have someone on the show, there's a 99% chance that I've asked that person to come on the show. Now, Ty's thing, you also have to know, these people have, they have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Tendencies. Ty is a... So I, you know, I, I did the whole, like, this guy's a green texter, a blue texter. Yes, 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 yes. Ty's a very quick replier. Uh-huh. However, very quick. Surprisingly quick. However, he is also one who will disappear for 48 to 72 hours after a win. You, there is no, you don't even get the, you don't even get the scene with Ty. Yeah. And yeah, he yeah. talked about this on the show last time. Mm -hmm. He just, he's gone. So did I throw the Hail Mary? Sure. Has he seen it? No, nope. <laughs> no, he has not seen it. And and I can see when's the last time he's, you know, if you use WhatsApp. So again, for the Ty Tui bosses of the world, for the Izzy's of the world, for the Bobby Greens of the world, uh, Bobby Green is mad at me, by the way. Bobby, uh, again, I thought we were. No, Bobby Green says that he made a promise to himself many years ago that he would never come on my show because I disrespected him. I have no idea what he is talking about. Didn't, I thought you and Bobby smoothed this over. Did I make that no. up? No. Oh, this is no, standing. Okay. I reached out to him. You used to have Bobby on all the time. Yes. And then something soured here. I don't I know thought what. you guys had made up since then. Do you I, remember I what happened? I have no idea. No. Yeah, I don't know. Because I remember those being great. I loved oh, used to... when Bobby was on the show. Is it not weird though, like when you have people on the show like a lot and then they get very famous and then they don't want to come on the show. Like, I just always found that to be weird. Um, I mean, if you have some examples, that'd be good. No, no. Uh, big win for Renato Moicano. Great post-fight interview as well. Bobby Killed Green it. with the big win. Andre Arlovsky with the big win. Casey O'Neill with the big win. Kyler Phillips with the big win. What's your beef with Carlos Alberg, by the way? I have no beef with Carlos That's Ulberg. what he keeps saying. Who keeps saying that? Carlos Alberg? No, GC. <laughs> Why? I have no I beef don't know. You with Carlos Alberg. Well, what's the beef? No beef with Carlos Olberg. What's his beef, GC? I don't know, man. He just did not want me to bet on him. <laughs> Why? Easy winner. That is accurate. I did not want Carlos. I did Why? not want him to bet on Carlos Olberg. I, I thought the line was bad on that one. I mean, I, did we see the performance? Like, it just mm. wasn't that, that Should great. have been a minus 1,000. <laughs> no, I I, uh, I have no uh, nothing against Carlos Olberg. Handsome man. Very Ronnie handsome. Lawrence, Jacob Malkoon. Douglas Eat. Silva de Andrade was a crazy fight. That fight against Sergey uh, Marosov. I'm not trying to steal your thunder here, but I feel yeah, like I should. Yeah, I mean, should... you just, you mean well, let's name the whole card then. No, but I'm just trying. Okay, well, uh, I felt like I didn't get, because we rushed yeah, into the gene. No, 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 it's okay. Jeremiah Wells. You do that it. was you weird. Uh, are you going to shout out Jeremiah Wells for the start of his fight? You just, you just okay. rattle him off. Let's go through the whole card fight by fight. Uh, William Knight missed point by like 40, pounds. <laughs> yeah, he, he had a bad miss. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think we have to, at least say that there was an accept that fight came together on short mm -hmm. notice. Um, like maybe don't take that fight if you're going to miss by 12 pounds. That's, you know, a natural um, conclusion drawn from that. But I do think it's, you have to acknowledge that um, the circumstances around that fight were not just, he got the fight, you know, two months ago and decided to show up um, that overweight. It was, it was short notice. Um, but yeah, no, ex no, not to give an excuse. That's not an excuse. Don't take the fight then if, if you can't make the weight, I, th I think is appropriate to say there. But he suffered the penalty for it. He paid 40% of his purse um, over to uh, Maxime Grisham. Yeah. All right, I'm done. That's it. I just want to I mean, I got nothing. What do you want me to do? Well, I mean, I'm just, ma I just mentioned the winners. You have specific things you want to say. I do. I, I want to, I mean, we have to. I, uh, we've been doing it all week and 
uh, we had her on the show, but you have to acknowledge again one more time, one last time on on. Well, we did that already. Segment. No. Oh, okay. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, Roxanne Modafferi. Used to work with Roxy. Yeah. So I was gonna say, you know, we when you were talking with her about some of her moments, I very distinctly remember when Roxanne was coming off tough and came back to Invicta. And at the time, I was doing public relations. I was I was working at an agency that that had Invicta as a client, and I was doing public relations for Invicta. And I remember her stock wasn't particularly high at that time. And she reeled off a bunch of really, really impressive wins um, for that organization and really got people thinking about her in a different way. I think this coincides with the time that she uh, made the move to Vegas and um, uh, syndicate and was was training there um, and really made people recognize that like she is going to be at the level um, of of being UFC caliber and it brought then they I believe they brought her back on tough right she did two stints on tough mm-hmm. uh, and she was in the final against Nico Montano um, had a good fight there uh, as as she said you know one of the memories was was her being on the losing side of that um, but yeah like carved out a very um, respectable uh, Invicta and UFC run when I don't think many had that in mind for her. I, th- I thought there were, you know, at that time there were a lot of people doubting her. Um, so yeah, really good to see. And, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to do it as good as she did or as good as Sean Alshadi, who, if you haven't seen that piece oh, on yeah. MMAfighting.com, go see it. Uh, talking to the peers of Roxanne Modafferi and talking about, you know, what she meant to the sport. Um, you're not going to do better than Sean's piece. So, so go find that. Um, but farewell. And and happy trails to the happy warrior. Uh, yes. A really like um important and and pioneering career. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well said. Um, I am going to shout out Tai Tuivasa and not just for getting the win, but the one specific moment that I I like couldn't believe my eyes. When Ty was up against the fence, Derek Lewis was raining down punches on him, and he just decided to stand up. And fire back. The moment he, the moment he got his body back up, he decided to fire back. Tai Tuivasa is sacrificing for our enjoyment, and I appreciate that. Oh that is a God. man who is who is deciding. You know what? Derek Lewis may catch, might catch me here, and I might get really hurt, but I'm going to fire back and try to win this fight. Because um, there's a lot of people who, in that position, getting getting rained on by Derek Lewis, are making a business decision and deciding to go down, and that's it. Uh, tai Tuivasa is not that guy. So shout out to Tai Tuivasa. Shout out to Shui Vasa, his his business venture and him, uh, you know, trying to capitalize and, and market um, on what has made him very popular. Uh, so yeah, big week, big weekend uh, for Tai Tuivasa. I think Shui Vasas are out now, right? Like he's been promoting that. Yeah, yeah, they're week. they're out this week. But what so about the fact that him. they didn't show him doing? Yeah, that was weird. I, I'm not sure. So what apparently, that he from. did it. He did do it. He did. You could hear the crowd kind of react to it. So um, I, I have a theory as to what happened. Yeah, sure. Hit me because they've shown it every time in the past. Yes, so I think I think it's that. like this happy dad thing because then I saw him in the back on a video with the oh. uh, the full send guys. Wait, no. What are they? What are they? <laughs> the Nelk boys? The Nelk boys. Yeah. And and one of the guys, the guy who's always with him with the with the yeah, tank top, Steve. Steve, was in the back and they blurred out what he was wearing. Oh, I see. So a branding thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, Brock Lesnar famously. Yes. Um, so I think this so is the problem. Maybe I think Modelo. Modelo. Maybe Modelo's not happy about. Yeah. So uh, just all do the with a Modelo, for goodness sakes. Because I actually feel like this has made him into a bigger star. So you remember last time? I guess casually Wait, the shoey has has made him into. A bigger yes. Star? Of course. I mean, that's well, that's no, the I, brand. Well, no, no. Because I was gonna say like I couldn't believe it. Last time, Stone Cold's just watching UFC fights yes. and he tweets about it. Well, I mean, you had a hand in error. Oh, okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, oh, was that, was that? Were you, were you, yes, yes, yes. That out there but anyway, I got him on the radar. I mean, you totally missed that one. Um, now you're not going to show it? It's a huge, imagine Stone Cold doing his celebration and you're not showing it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it makes sense though. Uh, what makes the sense? The theory's a good one. Why it wasn't shown? No, I'm, listen, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm not in the truck making these decisions, so Stupid. don't come from my neck. Um, but shout out to Tai Tuivasa. Oh, Just what a story! Giving it up for our entertainment, like I, I, my mind was blown. I was like, I thought it was over, and he just decided to stand up and fire back. And not many do that against Derek Lewis and. That was a great fight. Unfortunate for Derek Lewis, obviously. You know the the Houston uh, the Houston fights have not gone well for him. But um, another man who does it for our entertainment. So shout out to Derek Lewis as well. Yeah, I feel for Derek. Listen, I I gotta I gotta Rick's pick. I gotta shout out for Bobby Green here, but maybe I won't do it. You know, I don't I don't want to. 
No, listen, wanna, listen. Hurt your feelings. Listen, you wanna, shout out anyone. You were, I mean, <laughs> I don't want This is we're unbiased. Want to bring up bad? I don't want to bring no, up listen, some bad. I mean, uh, Tide Two Bus didn't respond to my text. I mean, yeah, you know what? So it's all good. I can handle oh, it. They forget. They forget they on forget. the way to the top. They forget. Um, shout out Bobby Green. Unique personality. A little bit. You know what I, I was thinking about? I think he came a little bit too early, mm. in the sense that like. He was doing some of the things that I think have made Kevin Holland kind of a, a, a success. A little bit of the the jawing with the in the cage, but even the style um, reminded me of of Kevin Holland a little bit. And I think that he would have been appreciated more in in a more modern era. I think at the time that he was doing it, and he said this in the press conference, and I, and it stuck it stuck out to me was he was talking about when he came in, it was a lot of like shut up, like nobody wants to hear from you. Whereas, like, now, talking in the cage is kind of celebrated. It's this thing that, like, mm-hmm. you know, the oh, styling cool. on people. Yeah, yeah. At the time that he was doing it, and this is early, you know, he he was in strike force in tw- since 2011, UFC since 2013. Crazy. I think he was looked at as, like... That's nuts. Isn't that crazy? Bobby Almost Green's 10 been years. UFC since 2013. Um... He, I think he came a little bit early, and and I and it, I, for some reason Kevin Holland's the one that comes to mind. I, it's probably just you know the direct relation to the talking to your opponent thing, but like when he was doing it, it was like shut up, Bobby Green, like disrespect mm-hmm. this and that. And now it's the thing that gets him celebrated. Um, but om, as you said, almost ten years of uh, fun fights from Bobby Green. The last couple have just been absolutely major. Um, so shout out to Bobby Green, really really fun um, and good run for Bobby. Amen. Also, he's great on the mic. You get you get the mic in front of that dude, and you and you're gonna get some gold. Yeah, he used to be um, great on the show. He used to be great on the show. Hope you know what? Let's not put that energy out there. Let's say hopefully he will be great again on this show. Who are you, That's Jared we'll Kennanier with the energy? <laughs> I don't like I don't like that negative energy. The oh, low, yeah, what did he say? Low um, frequency people. I'm just gonna, I don't, I'm just I don't gonna, want those yeah. low frequency people. Around. I'm just gonna listen to that every morning before I wake up. Yeah, you know him and Eugene both going in. Yeah, on, on social uh, media. On social media. I loved it. Um, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not the worst thing. I loved it. Um, okay, last one here. Yeah. This one's a bit of a curveball. Uh-oh. You may not know about this, but this will be interesting for you. Joe Rogan? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not not Joe Rogan. Not Joe Rogan. Oh my gosh! I was reached out to to a young man na- by the name of Luke Sheridan, who just fired me a message and is doing something really cool that I thought was interesting. It's called Bengal Bouts, and it's an annual charity boxing tournament hosted by the Boxing Club at the University of Notre Dame. Wow, we actually have assets for this one. Listen, I I ask for the full suite. (laughs) Okay, sorry, Uh, continue. 92nd annual, 92nd annual Bengal Bouts, coming up on February 24th. Uh, And and what what this is, is there's a fundraiser component. They support, uh, they, they use the funds to support education and healthcare initiatives in Bangladesh. So basically these these boxers, a tournament of boxers uh, from the university, uh, participate in this boxing event. This again, this is coming up on February 24th this year. Um, and uh, raise money to uh, to support education and healthcare in Bangladesh. So good cause. Um, and shout out to uh, to Luke for putting this on my radar and shout out to them. for doing Wow. That. Wait, so do they want me... Uh... Do you, you box charity? Well, Why not? I mean, let me let me shout out the let me plug the, the website. Okay, bengalbouts.nd.edu slash donate if you want to donate, or just Google Bengal Bouts, um, and you'll be able to find it. Why is it called um, Bengal Bouts? Um, uh, because of the region, Bangladesh, um, in the Bengal region. Wait, Bangladesh? Yeah, I thought you said University of Notre Dame. That it, yeah, so it is the University of Notre Dame. Their boxing club is raising money. To support this initiative. Oh, in I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's a it's a, a religious mission um, thing. That's that's the foundation. That's the basis for. Wow. It. Um, and this cool. and this guy just reached out to you. He reached out and said, "Hey, you know, this is something interesting that we're doing. Why not uh, talk about it?" And I'm happy to. I, I think that's really cool that right. uh, across Look the world you. people are raising money um, to help others and. Uh, our little combat sports world. Look, yeah. and and based on what I've been seeing online, they raised quite a bit of money. So uh, that's awesome. And, and I really appreciate that. I it's think you making uh, a difference. I mean, they're making a difference. I'm not doing... Well, you're doing shining nothing. a light you on You know what? Difference. But if I can get you to box in it, yeah, then maybe... No, who, for, let, who what, in Bangladesh? No, I don't think the fights actually happen oh. in Bangladesh. The, the funds just go um, there. Do you have any opponents of mine? Maybe Booker two Or no, Booker you kind of squashed no, that. No, we squashed no. it. Was that, a good, was that a good... Was that a good uh, curveball? 
what that you were that you were playing. You didn't even remember that we had a feud, so I, I didn't. I, no. I I completely blanked it. I mean, maybe you you know do it. It was very intense, and some people were. Uh, you th- what do you thought <laughs> I should like play the clips? What do you mean, like how they played every single interview I ever did with Jorge and Colby on the broadcast? <laughs> yeah, they did. Uh, they did every single one promo. I've done in the last four years was in that promo. I mean, you know what? To be honest, during that time. Nobody else other than you really did interviews with them, right? Like, oh, yeah. You are the source. I mean, the crap that I used to take, the shit sandwiches that I would have to eat just to get <laughs> Colby on the show. And now the dude, another guy won't talk to me. Colby's, Col- oh, Colby hurt his feelings. His feelings are hurt because uh, he said that um, what he, he didn't like the way uh, I spoke about his post fight against Woodley. The post fight stuff with Woodley. I don't remember that. I don't remember. You know, all the Black Lives Matter stuff and then um, the, uh, what did he say to Usman when they were yelling back and oh, forth? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Smoke yeah. was something, you yeah. know what I mean? Um, I mean, it was like the most tame criticism of it. And I guess when you're a heel, like, you know, you should probably let that stuff roll off your back, but, you know. No, he's, he's taking it personally. No, he's taking it personally, yeah. Well, Add listen, to the I list. Mean, just, we should have, just let like, him thank you for, for you know. Oh, yeah. The, there, there was this... Um, Fleet Week thing that they did. Yes, yes, I remember. Oh we, my we god, that up. the am, that. the amount of yeah. texts and phone calls about this Fleet Week thing, and I was like, you know what? We should try to show a different side of Colby. We should try to show him in a different light. And you know, poor Alex has to go out there and shoot this thing. Spend <laughs> the entire. I think it was Memorial Day weekend. It ended with up him. being really cool. It was a great piece, but like that happened. I'm sorry to say, Barry Horowitz, because of me. Wow, All right. I mean, you are just controlling the. Uh, I'm just. I'm, t- I'm, I'm just. I'm just. I'm just. Uh, no, you know what? I'm tired of it. I'm tired of these people, you know, forgetting about the guy who goes to bat for them. When the, it's one thing to say you're a Johnny Come Lately. I am the actual opposite of a Johnny Come Lately. I'm shining a, a spotlight when you're on the come up. You get it started. You yeah. get it off. You're not you're not there when it's all good. You're you're there when when it's kicking off. And then the elevator door opens at the top <laughs> and they're like and then it shuts whoop. with you outside. I once heard a great piece of advice from Charles Barkley back in the day. And Charles Barkley said the best piece of advice that he ever got was when you make it to the top, don't forget to send the elevator back down. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> a lot of people in this sport, you know. Need to talk to old Chuckster, you know? He could do worse than, than talking to Chuckster, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, Not that I, you know, lose sleep over this and hold yeah, a grudge yeah, no, about no. it, but. No, uh, no sleep, <laughs> sleep loss <laughs> over, over it. Um, that was it for me. Any other beefs we want to, or? Uh, uh, well, you know, I, I think I think uh, the Pat, is the Pat McAfee, the uh, Joe Rogan thing. I, I was saying Pat McAfee because people, I keep seeing people. Brock? Yeah. Him with Brock? What, do you, he have him drink beer or something? I didn't. I didn't see the context oh. of it. I just. I just see a lot of tweets yeah. like you got to watch this. You got to watch this. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Joe Rogan thing was super interesting. I'll give you, you know, my sure. side of it, and I'd love to hear yours. So I had heard on Wednesday that Wednesday night that he, you know, it was looking like he wouldn't be a part of the broadcast. And I heard on Thursday, Michael Bisping. Ooh. Actually, I was at the. Um, I actually had a lovely Friday afternoon. Um, and, and I've said this to her, so it's not like I'm saying it to you and not to her, but my wife went to have surgery and I had to wait in the city, Upper East Side for like six hours. I haven't can, walked. Can we ask what happened or is Oh yeah. I've talked right? about this. No, uh, she, uh, she cut her hand and she had a huge oh, gash. And you she did had, talk about the yeah, hand so cut. So she had to have surgery on the hand. Shout out to HSS hospital, uh, for special surgery. I think it is. Yeah. Isn't that the one that. Yeah. You'll Weidman see. and and Iaquinta and um actually uh sh- there's a there's a doctor there who reached out to me who does some work um you know with the New York based guys or there yeah. for the UFC reach out to me in October I called him for help with this he helped me it was he's from Montreal crazy story um All right. anyway I had six hours to kill on the Upper East Side I used to live on the Upper East Side as you know. And it was just kind of nice to like walk around New York. I hadn't walked around New York. You know, I come here, I go home. But to just walk around and, you know, stroll on Madison Avenue, like it was, I, yep. it was a very nice day weather-wise. Anyway, um, I kept, you know, I was kind of staying out of this one and I kept um, checking my phone. I was like, I wonder if anyone's going to pick up on this Rogan story because I know it's a huge story outside of the MA bubble. 
Sure. It's very clear within the MMA bubble, he has full support, much respect, but outside, I know. So that's why right before the weigh-ins, I said Twitter's about to get really interesting. Right, because he wasn't going to be on the weigh-in He stage. was going to be on the stage. Yeah. Uh, even once the weigh-in started, most people didn't seem to understand what I was talking about, which maybe I was <laughs> A giving cryptic. them too much credit. <laughs> I don't know, but some did, but not not all. Mm -hmm. Um and then right after the weigh-ins, the story came out via UFC PR, <clears throat> via UFC PR <clears throat> that he would not be <clears> – sorry. Something stuck in my throat. This will teach me not to have pineapple in the middle of the show. <laughs> um, I got no water. Uh, so Someone um, – UFC PR put out a statement that uh, – a scheduling conflict, right? Yeah. Um, and I called BS on that, uh, yeah. and I tweeted a GIF of carrying water. Some got it, some didn't. I was like, yo, you know, if you're reporting this, you're just carrying water. Now, what's interesting about that is you could be called a hater, but the next day, night, Dana White himself said that that was BS. We yeah. all knew there wasn't a scheduling conflict, right? Now, how about the fact that he's off the broadcast this guy who's been a huge part of the UFC events for so long, off the broadcast, and he's not a part of the show, and they say it's a scheduling conflict, and then it's coming from UFC PR, and Dana White himself calls BS on the statement that is put out by UFC PR? That, yeah. in its own right, was somewhat bizarre, right? So I had heard originally that it was a Disney call, and then I had heard the story that he said afterwards that it was a Joe Rogan call. Now, I will be honest, I don't necessarily believe the latter as much, if only because, A, full support from the MMA community, B, full support from the UFC community, C, full support from the UFC. Why is he asking out? Maybe there's too much going on. He's still doing his podcast. Um, why is he asking out? It wasn't a scheduling conflict. So anyway, there's a lot going on. I actually think it's a, it's a crazy thing that we're like paint like that. This has become such a big story, but sure. just to, you know, break the fourth wall from everyone. Yes. That's what the tweet was about. That's what the subsequent tweet was about. And I'm happy that Dana and I agreed on it. I called BS on the scheduling conflict. <laughs> he called BS on the scheduling conflict. Yeah. It just so happens that his own company put out the scheduling conflict tweet. So what do you think of this whole story? Yeah. I, I mean, I think you summed it up. Um, pretty decently. Did I? Because I feel like I'm rambling at this point. No, I think I think you did all right. Uh, Ugh, other I have than the like worst headache ever. dying <laughs> right in the middle. Other than like croaking Ugh. and keeling over right in the middle. No, you you summed it up nicely. Um, what did you make of Dana saying BS to his own company statement? Yeah, I mean, the problem with that though is he yeah he said you know basically what he said was there was no scheduling conflict. This was Joe Rogan's choice, and that part is the part that makes me a little. Um, unsure of what's really happening um, because of the fact that it would have been easy for Dana White to just say, yeah, scheduling conflict as UFC um, had, had issued, said in their, in their issued statement um, because Joe Rogan has had scheduling conflicts in the past and has not uh, worked events. There have been events that he has not worked due to that. So it would have been easy to do that. The fact that Dana White didn't um, say that and said actually it was Rogan's choice makes me wonder if there was, you know, involvement from Rogan there as opposed to just um, him being asked to not be on the broadcast or whatever, you know, version of that we believe might have happened um, because it would have been easier to just say that. Um, but to dispute that. Makes why, me, yeah, why lie about it? Dispute that makes me think that maybe Rogan did, you know, say, hey, maybe it's better if I lay low and don't, you know, do this one. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I think, you know, obviously we, we need to hear from Rogan, we'd need yeah. some real answers on this to understand what's what's really going on. But yes, I, I think it was interesting that Dana White immediately said, no, it, there was no scheduling conflict. And in fact, Rogan was the one who asked not to. It, it would have been smoother and, and easier to just not say that um, if, if that was the case. Let's say that's true. Yeah. Rogan, you're saying, let's say it's true that Rogan said, hey. Does that I'm surprise you? Um, No, it doesn't. Uh, from the perspective that... um. I consider Joe Rogan to be a smart enough man to un, to read the room and understand that like, look, there's a lot of heat on Spotify who pays him a lot of money. There's a lot of heat on him personally. Um, maybe it's not the best time to do that. But it's not like he's taking a break from the Spotify podcast. He's still doing them. 
He yeah, had one on Friday. Paid. That's what he gets paid to do. Yeah, and this is the fun thing that he does in the sandbox. I would, if that yeah, truly is, the is the, if that's truly the reason, I'm surprised that that's the reason. Number one, because that's never been Joe Rogan, and number two, that's never been the UFC, right? You yeah. know, he has full support from the UFC. I am surprised that Dana didn't use that opportunity to be like, let me just tell you something about Joe Rogan right now, and like yeah. give us like a go classic five yeah. minute. Dana, you know, sort of like is what, he, he, what is he did basically. Yeah, exactly in different way, in a different way, obviously, but like, yes, uh, in short. So I was surprised about that. The only reason I a hundred percent, I agree with you there. Like I'm surprised Dana didn't, but Dana putting it on Joe Rogan makes me think that maybe there is some, you know, something to that. Um, the idea though of, you know, Joe, Ro that doesn't seem like Joe Rogan. He wouldn't have done that in the past. Look, the stakes are the stakes are different now for Joe Rogan, as as this this right. coming to light has been an example of. There's things that he could have said ten years ago. There's things he could have done ten years ago, um, that would have flown under the radar and not been noticed. Now he's under the microscope. This is, this is a completely different scenario for him now. Um, and I think there could be some logic to like, hey, maybe let me not um, make myself be front and center and, and the center of attention again. I it, I think Joe Rogan could have very. Um, comfortably done the UFC broadcast, got in, got out, and not it, not have been a particularly um, spotlighted thing. Yeah, um, no one would have. I mean, come on. So it's I don't, not. you know, again, but I mean, this is all, you know, this is all speculation until yeah. Joe Rogan speaks on also, it. Also, the last pay per view was three weeks ago. The last pay per view was three weeks ago. Yeah, it's not like this is a three week old thing. What do you, uh, what do the, you mean? This controversy dates back. Months ago, it, like it, this has been a thing now for weeks. No, the, I mean, there's more now, though. Yes, with the with the with the racial stuff. Yeah, it was different because at first it was for two seventy. You know, it wasn't there. Nation, and then I don't know the timeline exactly. But it was pretty darn so. close. I'll, I'll say this: the microscope, uh, the um, the not the microscope, the the heat, the light yeah. is brightest right now, right? Is the, it? This is as yeah. bright as it's been, in my opinion. Um, so I get it. I get why he and I'm. I don't know if this is even his choice. Like, I don't even know if, if he did choose to do that, but I, if he had, I, I understand that I, I get people why. need to understand also that what's very interesting about the dynamic, um, in terms of the broadcast on ESPN is unlike the yeah. NBA, unlike the NFL, unlike major league baseball, hockey, UFC, the league, if you will, the organization, they pick yep. the broadcasters. They work for them, right? Anik works for them. DC works for them. Right. Meaning them being UFC, uh, Bisping, Felder, Laura Sank, they work for, they work if for you're UFC. working on the broadcast, you're working for the UFC. So it's it's not like, you know, the New Orleans Pelicans don't get to pick who's calling the game or the Raiders, et cetera. So that makes it interesting. But that being said, of course, ESPN and Disney have a say in things, right? If they really don't like someone, um, they'll have a say. And oh, by the way, if ESPN Disney really likes someone and the other side don't like them, they'll have a say as well. You know what I mean? Like if ESPN Disney say we want someone on the broadcast and UFC says we don't want them, they'll, you know, there's a, you know, yes. I was making a joke about myself, but you didn't get that one either. No, I, anyway, oh, I got it. Uh, you just kind of no sold it. Anyway, so <laughs> to me, it's a lot more plausible just knowing the figures we're talking about right now that there was a lot of heat, as you said, and ESPN yep. and Disney said, you know what, for this one, let's just take a knee and, uh, you know, we'll come back in March. Feels yep. like a very easy thing to say. I don't know for why sure. we had to lie about scheduling conflict. I don't know now why we're saying it's... What I was told initially was that that's what happened. And then I will admit, more people started to tell me Friday night, oh, no, 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 this was his call. I'm like, yeah, well, who told... Like, Where's that coming from? Oh, it's coming from within the organization. Well, it's the same organization that said scheduling conflict. So, yeah. you know, who do we believe? We, we will we will not know an answer until Joe Rogan And also, speaks. is there a part of me that just doesn't, like, is it okay to say I just don't really care or no? N no, it's definitely okay. okay. Um, <laughs> it is definitely okay to say that you don't really care whether Joe Rogan has that spot or doesn't. I, you know. And before anyone calls me a hater, I have said on this show yeah. very recently, I like Joe on the pay-per-views. Like I, 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 I don't want Joe to get canceled. I don't want him to get whatever the word you want to use. I think he has a nice role on the pay-per-views. He has yeah. reached a point in his career that he has elevated the brand. It used to be the brand elevating him. Now he's elevating the brand because he's so famous. Now we're reaching into a whole different territory with this controversy, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm not trying to get him out of like, I just think like, wow, I, I guess I can't believe this whole thing has become such like 
I was thinking back, sorry for going all crazy, but like I was thinking back to UFC, I think it was 97 in Montreal and I was with my friend Mo and we were just kind of sitting around and Rogan was having a comedy show at a very small bar in Montreal, very small. And this is when Rogan and I would text and all, and I went to see mm -hmm. him. There must've been 50 people there. Yeah. And this wasn't that long, maybe a decade ago. It just kind of blows my mind that he is legitimately the most influential media person on the planet. Yeah, right? he is the most discussed media person in Crazy. the world right now. Crazy. Anyway. I, I would him. I would say though, no, no, no. I would say though that he might not even consider himself a media person. You know, he's uh the way he's kind of framed it up is having conversations, right? He's not necessarily doing hard reporting and he's right. carved out that kind of differentiation for himself. Um I I think, you know, this is because of his position with the UFC and because of how much money is, is on the line with Spotify, this is going to continue to be a conversation. And I also think it's okay for people to say um, these things that he's done, there should be some accountability. Mm -hmm. And I think it's okay for that to transfer to the UFC, right? Like that is something else that he's doing and, and there should be um, a conversation around it. So, right. it, you know, yeah. This is all part of it. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's as simple as like, yeah, that's related to the podcast and things he said there and the Spotify stuff. Like this is all this is all part of Joe Rogan being the personality that he is. Um, but it, it it is certainly different than it was. Um I would just say in conclusion, like we, you know, at least in my mind had our falling out because I didn't appreciate that he spread misinformation following sure. 199. And just to you know, you got to be clear with that. He spread misinformation about your... About my situation. Yeah, it was very personal to me, right? Very, very personal to me because here I am like fighting for my career and you're going on your show and saying that I was told stuff when that never happened, yep. all this stuff. And so I'll just say like, you, you could call yourself a journalist or not. You can consider yourself a media person or not. If you talk into this microphone, there's a responsibility. And sure. you can't hide behind the, I'm not a journalist or I'm not a media guy. And I'm just asking questions and I'm doing that. You can't hide behind that. Once you get this thing in front of you and you have a platform, there's a responsibility. And, you know, I think <laughs> misinformation now is becoming a problem with him. Um, and some people will be like, listen, he's just a guy asking questions you know, when it, when it, when it hits you personally, you may feel a different way about it. And that's yep. why I feel, you know, a different way about him. But again, as far as the broadcasts are concerned, I've never had an issue with them. And I don't understand why there's this like passionate fan base who don't want him on the broadcast. Trust me, there's more passionate people who want him on, but there are yeah, some you're people in the echo chamber that, you know, don't want him on. Uh, it doesn't bother And you're me speaking just on the basis of his, of his, work product, right? We're not talking about necessarily the controversy here. You're talking about the Oh, I'm just I'm talking about dating but yeah. two years ago if you would have people asked who me just about don't this. want him on because they don't believe he's good at the now commentary. yes, yeah. yes. Thank you for the assist there. Uh now is a totally different thing and we'll see how yeah. this plays out. But like yeah. I, I've never been one who was like get Joe Rogan off the podcast. Yeah. I'm talking two thousand eighteen, nineteen. When it when it got to the point where he was just doing the pay per views, I thought that was a nice role for Same. him. Yeah, I, I I think it wasn't that long ago that I said if I could still have any booth, it would be Joe Rogan and Mike Holberg right right now. Period. Like this right. this booth, and I might take some some heat. Well, that's that. one of the crazier things you've ever said. <laughs> but, um, no, but I don't just, know. I think I've said some yeah. some pretty crazy things. But look, I mean, there's there's something nostalgic about that. And yeah, I I I personally uh, like when he's in the booth. But um, I do think that there has to be some kind of reckoning here. There needs to be some kind of acknowledgement of of what's going on. It, it can't yeah. just be this like siloed, hey, we're just going to do this this commentary and then go out. And I right. think he's probably acknowledged that as well. Um, and that's why I think if this came from Disney, then it would be totally acceptable. It makes sense, Disney right? should it, have a say who's on their broadcast, who's yeah. on their air. Yeah. So I it guess the lesson sense. is well, don't lie. The other, the other thing that's very <laughs> interesting, and we didn't even talk about this part of it, is Dana White said – or the, the the PR statement, I'm getting them confused at the at this moment, said that he'd be back for 272. Right. Yeah. So quite definitively. I mean, yeah, that that seems like uh well, it was just a scheduling conflict. Yeah, that seems like the, yeah, there's more there's more to the scenario. There's 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 more going on and, and it needs to be said. And we'll see if Joe Rogan is the is the one to address it. The text part there. I mean, like we're in this mess because of misinformation, and then we're texting about broken hands and they're not broken <laughs> yeah. listen i mean yeah. i think that one's a little bit overblown i'll be honest Come on. what you, 
like, yeah, like he was just pointing something out. I, first of all, we don't know if he necessarily wanted that to be read on air. Let's sure. let's be completely honest about that. Um, also, at the time, would... we were thinking scheduling conflict and like and watching. he's watching. Yeah. yeah, maybe don't you know that to me that feels like maybe he got put in some in a situation that he yeah, wasn't necessarily uh, looking to be put into. He has to do that. You're right. Um, but let's not pretend that in the in the line of duty in his uh, commentary, he doesn't do that a lot. He, right. it, you know, I think something's wrong with this X Y Z thing. He he does that quite a bit, and sometimes he's right and sometimes he's wrong. There's been times where he's been right, so let's not you know pretend that it's it's always um, it's always sure. one way or the other. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if he necessarily was welcoming that uh, that to be read. Um, but yeah. All right. It is what it is. Yes, well said, Max. Uh, appreciate it. <laughs> Thank we'll you, talk sir. to you next week. There he is, New York Rick, everyone. All right, we're out of time. 271 in the books. Back on Wednesday, a couple of in-studio guests. I wonder what their names are. We'll see. I have the worst headache of all time. It feels like my, my frontal lobe is going to explode. Why does this keep happening? I probably need to get this checked out at this point. Because it is killing me. Headphones are awesome I don't know what it is. Is it the headphones? I appreciate your concern, though, Frank. Why? You see, like, why did I bring up these papers here? Well, there's nothing for me to read off these papers right now. It yeah, it's like okay, it's Someone's me. Like, that's super official. Yeah, you know, like when someone takes the papers at the end of the newscast and they're like. And then they'll write something. They'll do like a big scribble, like, okay, we're done for the day. I always appreciated those little things, those intricacies. Uh, but I have nothing to read off these papers. I do want to thank DraftKings, as always, for their support. And uh, I want to thank all of today's guests. And I want to thank all of you. Thank you very much to Eugene Behrman. Congratulations to him on the big win uh, this past Saturday. Curious to see when we get Izzy back. Maybe it's in June. Maybe it's against Jared Cannonier. It would certainly make sense with the April and May cards already filled up. Thank you very much to Jared Cannonier. Good luck to him in getting that fight. And congratulations on the big win. Uh, I'm down with that fight. I don't know why some of you are not down with that fight. I think it's an interesting fight. It's a fresh face. That's what we want for Izzy right now. Thank you and happy trails to the great Roxanne Modafferi. So happy to see that she got all that love. Thank you very much to Booker T. Happy that we buried the hatchet and I was able to tell my truth. And of course, good luck to Johnny Walker this Saturday against Jamal Hill. Thanks to the crew as well. Back on Wednesday, same time and place. Until then, I say peace.